Thank you very much. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary, Fergus Ewing, to speak to and to move the motion. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to open the Stage 1 debate on the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill, a significant day for the South of Scotland. Members will recall that in May 2016, the First Minister announced an end-to-end -end review of the enterprise and school system. We wanted to ensure that it was delivering effectively for the people of Scotland. One of the key recommendations of the review was to establish a new enterprise agency for the south of Scotland. This bill establishes that new body, an organisation that will focus on inclusive growth, supporting a diverse and resilient economy, an organisation able to respond to the different and distinct rural economy of the south of Scotland, an organisation welcomed by the south. Uh, so I'm proud to be the minister leading this bill through Parliament. I wish to thank the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee for their careful and thorough stage one scrutiny and the other uh, committees that contributed. Their report quotes fully supports the creation of a new enterprise agency for the south of Scotland quotes and quotes supports the general principles of the bill and recommends to Parliament that they be agreed. The report goes on to make a number of helpful recommendations and observations about the detail of the bill and I've offered a written response to the committee on these. And I look forward to further consideration of their recommendations and points made today. <clears throat> we couldn't have got here without the support of those in the South of Scotland. Our work has been informed by the people of the South of Scotland. We have listened to what they have said and have responded and many people have offered their views. I'm particularly grateful to the 268 folk who took the time to respond to our pre-legislative consultation. Signing officer, almost 90% of those agreed with our vision and over 500 people attended public meetings last year. The committee also benefited from 120 responses submitted in response to its call for views. Continuing engagement remains key as the legislative process and we take forward work to establish the agency. I want to make sure that the agency is rooted in the South and driven by the South. My officials were in Gala Shields and Kakubri last week, presenting officer, hearing from over 50 community representatives. I welcome the future events that the South of Scotland Economic Partnership will run later in spring and early summer. And these events will provide an opportunity for both individuals and businesses to continue to shape our work. Let me say a bit about the South of Scotland Economic Partnership. We established this as an interim measure whilst we are taking through legislation to establish the agency itself. The partnership brings together the public, private, third and education sectors to support activity across the area. In its first year, it's bringing a fresh approach to economic development, delivering strong stakeholder engagement and paving the way for South of Scotland enterprise. I look forward to this continuing over the next year as we move to the agency. I should like to thank the partnership's chair, Professor Russell Griggs, for his energy and his personal commitment. I should also like to thank his board. I welcome their deep understanding of the region's needs and their commitment to working with us to make a difference. I met with them, I attended a board meeting, and I was thoroughly impressed uh, by the diligence and imagination and energy that they have brought to their task. And finally, I want to recognize the contribution of the public sector partners and the support they have brought. The partnership's activities have been shaped around local needs and priorities, responding to consultation with businesses and communities from across the region. We are supporting the work of the partnership with additional investment, 10 million pounds this financial year and 12.7 million the next financial year, and I think I should express my gratitude to the gentleman on my right, the Finance Secretary at this point, to make this possible. And that investment is supporting activity that wouldn't otherwise have been possible, responding to the needs of the South of Scotland. We're investing in skills with over six million pounds, supporting the development of a learning network, making it easier for people to access opportunities and there are projects across communities in the South helping to build their economic capacity and future success. We're all aware of issues impacting on the economy of the South of Scotland. Its population is aging with fewer people of working age. Its young people are, in some cases, leaving the region 
and not seeing opportunities to return. Wages are low with the council areas ranking 30 and 32 in terms of median weekly earnings. But it is an area with many natural advantages which makes it attractive for residents, businesses and visitors. It's strategically well placed. It has significant land assets and energy resources. It has active further and higher education sectors and innovative businesses operating across the sectors. It has vibrant communities with a rich history and culture. Presiding officer, the new agency builds on our commitment to the South. Our investment of £353 million in the Borders Railway, uh, of over £32 million since 2017 developing school campuses, <coughs> £275 million in the state-of-the-art Dumfries and Galloway Royal Infirmary, completed in December 2017. £133 million due by the end of 2021 to improve internet connectivity in the south, the biggest public investment ever made uh, in a UK broadband project. Uh, and finally, a commitment of £85 million to deliver the Borderlands Inclusive Growth Deal. The new agency will bring additional investment to the region. We have committed to funding it on the same per capita basis as we fund Highlands and Islands Enterprise, recognising the similarity of both remit and challenge. The bill... Can I take an yes, of course. Oliver Mundell. I'd be uh, very grateful to the Minister if he was able to set out what the budget would have been uh, this year on that basis uh, to give uh, businesses in the south of Scotland an idea of the type of investment that's coming uh, once the final agency is with us. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm not quite sure, I'm, it might be my fault, but I'm not quite sure I understand the, the, the question I have, given the, the current budget of 10 million and the budget of 12.7 million pounds for next year. The, the, well, well, I think I want to, to move on. And the financial, I'll come back to it in closing perhaps if the member wishes, but the financial memorandum sets out more detail which uh, the time for which I don't have to go into now uh, but the financial memorandum is there it sets out the the facts as to the process but I think it's fair to say presiding officer that there was a, a, a an agreement I think on the committee so far as I recall we're here shortly the the principle which governs our progress that pro rata the funding should move to become at the same level as HIE over time but that a new body needs to learn to walk before it can run. It will take some time for that to be implemented. That is all clearly set out both in the memorandum and I think in the, the evidence, Mr. Mandel, to the uh, committee. And I think that is the, broadly the right approach, but it's a fair point and we'll no doubt come back to it during the course of this afternoon. So the bill will establish a new enterprise body for the South of Scotland. Our vision is for a body that will drive inclusive growth increase competitiveness and tackle inequality within the south of Scotland through maximising the area's contribution to Scotland's inclusive growth, supporting a diverse and resilient economy, sustaining and growing communities, building and strengthening communities with joined up economic and community support, and harnessing the potential of people and resources, developing skills, promoting assets and resources, and maximising the impact of investment in the area. <coughs> the bill is deliberately high level and enabling. It sets out the overarching strategic aim of the body to further the economic and social development and improve the amenity and environment of the south of Scotland. It gives a few examples of the sorts of activity that the body could undertake but does not suggest an exhaustive list. That approach ensures maximum flexibility for the new body to shape the activities it takes forward and respond to the circumstances of the South. As well as setting out the aims of the new body, the bill makes provision for its structure and legal framework, ensuring that it can operate effectively. I want to touch briefly on some of the recommendations made by the committee. The committee recommended we develop appropriate mechanisms to facilitate collaboration and coordination between agencies. The new agency will be part of the strategic board, ensuring national alignment. We will ensure that the new agency works collaboratively with other organizations. The committee also recommended the new agency carries out work to obtain feedback on its performance and effectiveness from communities and other stakeholders. <coughs> 
It's crucial that the new body is accountable to local people. We are working with stakeholders to put in place arrangements to deliver this when the body is operational. It's important that we build on existing successful regional structures like the South of Scotland Alliance. Of course, as well as establishing the legislative framework for the new agency, we need to take forward work to deliver the new body. If Parliament agrees, presenting officers to the principles of the bill today, that activity will increase. Our work here will ensure that we have a credible agency ready to assume its legislative functions on the 1st of April next year. The practical arrangements put in place will enable it to begin and develop its vision, building its capacity and capability from its establishment. We'll begin, if Parliament approves the principles of the bill, the appointments process for the new chair. This will ensure that the future leaders of the agency are also are involved in the decisions to establish the body. We will also ensure that the new agency is able to operate everywhere across the south of Scotland. That accessibility was a strong view expressed by those who contributed to the consultation. In closing, presiding officer, establishing a new enterprise agency for the south of Scotland is a great opportunity to do things differently in the south. I will continue to work across this chamber to ensure that the legislation establishes a body that is as successful as it can be, helping to drive transformational inclusive growth, increase competitiveness, promote fair work, and tackle inequality for all in the south of Scotland. I move that the Parliament agrees to the general principles of the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill. Thank you very much. I now call on Edward Mountain on behalf of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to contribute to this debate in my capacity as Convener of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. The Committee's Stage 1 report was published on the 1st of March, and this made it clear that it fully supports the creation of a new enterprise agency for the South of Scotland. And I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for his letter of the 24, uh, 21st of March, which responds to the various recommendations in the report. It became very clear to the committee when it started its stage one scrutiny that there was a huge level of interest in the proposals from all sectors in the Scottish borders and Dumfries and Galloway. The committee is extremely grateful to all of the organisation and the individuals who provided oral and written evidence to the form to inform our deliberations. As part of the evidence gathering, the committee held a formal external meeting and an informal workshop in Dumfries as well as a discussion event in Galashiels. These, these sessions were particularly well attended by a wide range of representatives of stakeholder groups and members of the public. Over 140 people attended the discussion events and the committee is grateful to all those who participated, providing valuable input into the consideration of the bill. The committee's formal meeting in Dumfries was held in the evening to allow more local people to come along and given that it was attended by over 60 pe people, the committee felt that this was extremely worthwhile. Overall, the committee heard strong support for the creation of the new enterprise agency. Over 80% of respondents to the committee's online survey also agreed with the idea of a new agency being established. This sentiment was mirrored by a significant majority of those who provided oral and written evidence and by those who attended the informal public meetings. After taking evidence, the committee itself was in no doubt that the creation of a new enterprise agency in the south of Scotland is required. It is clear that the area faces significant number of economic, social and geographic challenges which have not and are not being addressed through the current economic support mechanisms. It was, over, it was overwhelmingly of the view that of most of those who gave evidence or engaged with the committee that the new agency will help support the enterprise and skills and the needs of the area provide, and provide a vehicle by which to encourage economic growth. The committee commends the South of Scotland Economic Partnership for the significant consultation and preparation work it has carried out. It is clear to us that it provides a solid foundation on which to develop the new body. Turning to the area, based on the evidence it received, the committee is satisfied that the new proposals that the new enterprise agency should cover Dumfries and Galloway and the Scottish Border Council areas only. However, 
It also heard that views expressed that it should also perhaps be extended to cover adjoining local authority areas where communities may face similar challenges to those in Dumfries, Galloway and the Scottish borders. Whilst the committee did not believe that the area to be covered by the agent should be altered, it called on the Scottish Government and the Scottish Enterprise to ensure that these areas continue to have access to economic development opportunities appropriate to their needs. Now, the, we welcome the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to supporting all regional, regional economies as he has done in his letter. The committee also heard that it was important for the new agency to have sufficient flexibility to allow it to operate out with its geographical boundaries and to collaborate with other enterprise agencies in order to fulfill its role. I welcome the confirmation in the Cabinet Secretary's letter that the bill will be drafted uh, to provide for this. The committee also called on the Scottish Government to ensure that development of appropriate mechanisms to facilitate collaboration and coordination between the new agency and all of the existing agencies operating in the region, building on the positive work already being carried out by the South of Scotland Enterprise Partnership. We are encouraged that the Cabinet Secretary has asked his officials to explore this matter with stakeholders and will respond to the committee formally in advance of Stage 2. Turning to powers and objective, the objectives, the committee acknowledges that the broad aims of the new agency set out in Section 5 of the Bill have been drafted with the express purposes of avoiding a prescriptive approach and thus providing flexibility. However, in evidence at its discussion events, the committee heard that it would be beneficial to have these supplemented to cover several key areas. In response to this, it called on the Scottish Government to amend the aim of the bill to improve the amenity and the environment to the areas covered by the new agency in stage two to make specific provision in relation to the sustainable use of the environment. The committee further called on the Scottish Government to amend the aim of furthering the economic and social development of the south of Scotland to make specific provision in relation to the following. Encouraging the development of a sustainable economy, supporting the enhancement of transport networks and digital connectivity, supporting community land ownership and asset ownership, furthering fair work and encouraging the creation of a more balanced demographic. We note that the Cabinet Secretary is to further consider these recommendations. Turning to the location, the location of the new agents was a recurring discussion point. It was clear, however, there was very strong support for co-locating it with other agencies where this is practical. The committee is of the view that this will bring significant benefits in terms of having a presence in and being accessible across the whole area, adding to the provision of a one-stop shop approach as well as being a more cost-effective cost approach in the establishment of this agency. Let's turn to governance. A clear message received by the committee was that getting the broad membership of the new agency right was very important. The committee agrees wholeheartedly with this and considered it is essential that the board is made up of individual, individuals with as wide a range of interests, skills and expertise and experience relevant to the south of Scotland as is possible. And I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's indication that he will ensure that applications are encouraged from as wide a range of interests as possible. We looked at accountability, and in considering the bill, the committee reached a view that the mechanism, a mechanism was required to ensure that there was genuine local accountability for the new agency in terms of its performance and its effectiveness. It has therefore called on the Scottish Government to bring forward an appropriate amendment to require the new agency to obtain feedback on these issues to inform the action plan and development process. I note the Cabinet Secretary has stopped short of saying this, that he will do this, instead saying that he has asked his officials to consider how this will be delivered in the new agency once it is operational. On finance, the funding, the committee considers the Scottish Government's intention to ensure that initially there is an equivalence in budget provided for the new agency and that of HIE to be an appropriate and proportionate approach. The committee also noted that the £42 million of funding for the new agency in 2022-23 would provide an increase 
in funding for the area. However, it asked the Scottish Government for an estimate of how much an actual increase in funding this would represent. I note from the Cabinet Secretary's written response that he will respond further th to the Committee on this particular issue. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, the Committee looks forward to considering amendments at Stage 2 which will further enhance a bill that has a high level of support amongst stakeholders and communities in the south of Scotland. As it stated in its Stage 1 report, the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee supports the general principles of the bill and recommends to this Parliament that they be agreed to. Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. And I call on Finlay Carson to be followed by Colin Smith. Finlay Carson. I'm pleased to be opening the debate for the Scottish Conservatives this, af this afternoon. As the constituency MSP for Galloway and Western Freese, it's fair to say that the constituency I serve is a vast one with 75 miles between Stranraer and Dumfries. So the need for a dedicated agency recognising the unique needs of the south of Scotland region has been long overdue. And today's stage one debate is a hugely positive step in the right direction for local people and businesses. In our 2016 election manifesto, the Scottish Conservatives highlighted the urgent need to replicate the success of the Highland and Islands enterprise by creating a South of Scotland enterprise agency. Coupled with the recent announcements of the Borderlands Growth Deal, another Conservative manifesto commitment for the South of Scotland, and it's now being delivered. The region stands on the cusp of a huge economic boost, which it badly needs. And I'm delighted that in light of the increased Conservative representation in the region, that the SNP government have started to listen to calls from these benches and press ahead with creating the agency. The Borderlands Growth Deal showed the strength of the UK and the Scottish governments working together with a total funding package of 345 million for the cross-border region. With the communities that I represent in Galloway and Western Freese linking closely with the Scottish borders and our friends and neighbours in Carlisle and Northumberland on a daily basis, this can only strengthen these yet not fully exploited economic and social ties. Indeed, the Borderlands Partnership have described the plans as a game changer for the region and that will also apply to the new agency. It's important, however, that this chamber is aware that the economic, of the economic facts for the south of Scotland, and they are stark. The business startup rate in Dumfries and Galloway is significantly lower, with only 31 businesses per 10,000 people, compared to an average of 50 across Scotland as a whole. Even more concerning is the gross value added, a whopping 24% lower than the Scottish average, while the median weekly earnings are also 10% lower than the Scottish average. The lack of sustained growth in the south of Scotland has sharpened the focus on my region and in turn the need for a dedicated agency to support businesses in order for them to fulfil their potential. Constituents of mine are regrettably right when they say that the region is a forgotten corner of Scotland regarding the lack of action taken by this government, no matter what the issue is we're debating. Digital infrastructure, road infrastructure, rail infrastructure, health and education provision, when compared to other central belt neighbours. The need for a boost in infrastructure and to help provide the fertile environment for training and jobs in my region has never been greater. Creating that fertile environment for growth must be done in tandem with a taxation policy that will encourage people to live and work in the region. I will. Cabinet Secretary. Regarding his, his claim that, that we don't invest in the south of Scotland, is he aware that in financial year 2017 to 18, the Scottish Government spent over £1,200 million in the south of Scotland, the examples I gave in the opening speech. Uh, and does he agree with me that the recent success of Scottish enterprise, Scottish development uh, uh, international, working with the Scottish Government and the local authority uh, in finding a, a new investor to take over the Pinney's plant uh, in the shape of Atlantis Pack, it illustrates quite the opposite of his arguments that we are not involved in active promotion of the economy of the House of Scotland. Finley Carson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that, but if, if he was listening to it earlier, I said it's only now that this Scottish Government is actually stepping up to the, to the plate and starting to deliver. And we're only getting parity with the rest of Scotland, which has sadly, sadly fallen short in the past. At the moment, the policies that this government are pursuing, pack, backed up by the Greens, are hitting workers close to the border with higher tax rates than those living just a few miles away in Carlisle. 
We run the risk of having people working here but not wanting to pay the higher rate of tax, instead boosting the economies of, in, not in Dumfries but in Carlisle. We have a great opportunity ahead of us with the agency in the borderlands, so it would be very disappointing if we missed out on the very best talented individuals and businesses due to a misguided tax policy. We, no, I want to make some progress. We have at present cross-border organisations and individuals that live in Scotland and work in Carlisle. It's hardly fair that people doing the same job, earning the same salary, have quite a different take-home pay. I'll give way. To uh, Maureen Wood. Hey, you're still on your feet. <laughs> Maureen Wood. Thank, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank Finlay Carson for giving, giving way. Would he then uh, tell me why it is that so many people want to come from south of the border to north of the border to live here, especially older people who find it a great area to retire to? Finlay Carson. That's a very interesting point, to come to and retire. I, know that you, I knew the Scottish Government would counter with higher education, free education, free prescriptions on this side of the border. However, that's hardly, that's hardly relevant to the skilled workforce in, say, the 25 to 45-year-old band, which is exactly the demography that we want to attract to fill new job creation in this area. In one case, a relatively high tax earner is paying thousands of pounds more in tax than equivalent partner on the same income. If that, should you live south of the border and commute the short distance to Dumfries? So how many other high earners across the whole of south or central Scotland might be think thinking the same thing? I would like to point out just a couple of examples I've already raised with the SNP government and parliament. Firstly, in June 2017, I stressed that the agency must have an autonomous board similar to that of the Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Because far too long we've seen an SNP government that's obsessed with centralisation which takes local accountability away and is heralded an attitude that central government knows best. Government does not have a monopoly on good ideas, one size does not fit all, and we need a local board with local accountability. And I'm delighted that the Cabinet Secretary shares that view. This time last year, as the Finance Secretary announced £10 million worth of support for the South of Scotland Economic Partnership, I raised concerns and surprised that vital sectors of the economy, including tourism and energy, had not been included in the headline priorities at that time. Covering such a vast region, we can't afford for any sectors to miss out. That will be key. What will be key to the agency going forward is transparency and accountability. Now, I recognise the invaluable work and in, uh, the consultations that the South of Scotland Economic Partnership have undertaken under its chair, Russell Griggs. However, I've spoken to many local businesses during that time. The interim partnership has been in operation. There is a clear sense of frustration at some of the process. Businesses have been unaware of where to or whom they can apply for funding or the reasons behind decisions which have been made in regard to their applications. Lessons need to be learnt. It's vital that business has a voice in shaping policy and actually giving the respective agencies a steer on where the investment may be best directed. It's always been a concern of mine and others, and others that the Borderlands growth deal in particular has been council-led. And I have to question whether there are enough people with a relevant leadership that have had genuine business experience and the life at the coalface. I therefore have concerns that there's danger of this going forward, having too much public sector and council involvement. Businesses local have no desire to see a public sector and councils uh, control all their plans. They want an agency and projects they support to be autonomous from any council decision makers. Businesses don't want to run the risk of being undermined or the agency being undermined uh, and it's uh, striving for economic growth and investment. As the committee highlighted, going forward, the South of Scotland Enterprise Board must be made up of individuals, much like some of the indiv individuals on the South of Scotland Enterprise Partnership, who bring much interest, skills, expertise and experience as possible. We must encourage interest from individuals who will ensure the agency will deliver on its full potential. Another note of caution I would like to point out is that the vote in this parliament two years ago led by these benches which defeated plans to take away Highlands and Islands Enterprise Board and replace it with an overarching management committee. Mm. With a sense of relief those plans were defeated allowing Highlands and Islands to retain its local identity. As my colleague Edward Mountain said during the debate, Highlands and Islands Enterprise is not broken, it works so don't try and break it. 
All that said, the consultation process has given us a great starting point as we progress this bill through Parliament. Almost 90% of respondents to the consultation agreed with ambitious plans for the south of Scotland and outlined things that agency can build on that are already successful in the region, including tourism, land management, heritage, national capital, and our history, as well as quality of life. In conclusion, I would like to stress that the Scottish Conservatives are full of support for this bill at stage one, in line with the Rural Economy and Connectivities report. The region needs a dedicated vehicle that help to transform growth and help to provide more opportunities for people living and working here, from Stranraer in the west to Eyemouth in the east. What must happen now is a clear communication strategy so that businesses, college, universities and the third sector, including social enterprise, can be fully aware of the services this agency is going to provide and how they will benefit from them, which was highlighted in the conclusion of the committee's report. It was also highlighted in Gala Shields when the committee were in attendance that the agency must have a clear statement of ambition and resources rather than simply creating a new agency and hoping it works. We we'll look forward to strengthening the bill even further to meet the needs of local people with amendments at stage two and stage three of the bill. Presiding officer, after far too long a waiting period, we owe it to the south of Scotland to ensure this piece of legislation can truly meet their demands. Thank you very much. I now call Colin Smith to be followed by John Finney. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. It's a, it's a privilege to open this debate um, on the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill on behalf of Scottish Labour and to very much welcome this piece of legislation. It's a decade since the government abolished Dumfries and Galloway Enterprise and Scottish Borders Enterprise. And I believe that in hindsight, that decision will be seen as a mistake. Yes, it allowed more democratic accountability of those economic development functions that were subsequently transferred to local councils. But when other powers were centralised to Scottish Enterprise, I believe the remit and direction given to Scottish Enterprise from government ministers meant the south of Scotland lost out. That's why since then I and many others have campaigned vigorously for better support for the south of Scotland economy. In my first speech in this chamber in May 2016, I called for a, a radical change in the remit of government agencies to deliver that better support. I made this point in a, a quote from that first speech. It's simply unfair that a business in the Highlands and Islands can receive support, but because the remit of Highlands and Islands enterprise is different from that of Scottish enterprise, the same business would not receive the same support because it is based in the south of Scotland. I've campaigned against that fundamental inequality for a decade, including as chair of Dumfries and Galloway Council's Economy Committee and the South of Scotland Alliance. It was clear to me in those roles that the South of Scotland was a forgotten region, that the substantial economic challenges we faced were simply not being addressed. Challenges such as chronic levels of low pay. It's a scandal that the hourly earnings in Dumfries and Galloway is £11.52 per hour compared to a national average of £14.30, making the region the lowest paid in Scotland. There's also a real skills shortage in the area. Just over a quarter of the population of Dumfries and Galloway and the borders are graduates, yet the na nationally that figure sits at more than a third. There's also low levels of productivity and growth. The gross value added per person in Dumfries and Galloway is 21% lower than the national average, and it's 26% lower in the borders. As a result of these and many other economic weaknesses, many of our young people simply leave the area because of the lack of high paid, high skill employment opportunities. That's given the region a real demographic challenge with the working age population in Dumfries and Galloway sitting at 59% compared to a national average of 64%. But it's not just those challenges that aren't being tackled. The opportunities, the strength, the potential of the area is currently not being realized. I'm privileged to live in the south of Scotland. It's an area of outstanding natural beauty. It's historical and cultural heritage to rival anywhere in the country. Yet tourism, important as it is to the region, is still in many ways untapped. There are sectors with a reputation for excellence such as forestry, energy, arts and culture and more which offer real opportunities to the for the future but need better support to develop. We have a strong small business base. Now that has negative as well as a positive effect. When the area is hit by an economic tsunami such as the closure of pennies, it's difficult for small businesses alone to absorb the number of people looking for employment. But the number of small businesses does mean there is potential for many of those businesses to grow with the right level of support. A strategic location also means parts of the region are just hours travel to 14, two hours travel to 14 million people. That's 14 million potential customers in the central belt 
and the north of England. And crucially, there's a, a real community spirit, a desire, a real determination to make the south of Scotland better from the people who live there. That determination is one of the reasons why there is such a strong support in the area for this bill establishing the South of Scotland Enterprise Agency. And crucially, an agency that has that social element, allowing businesses and enterprises to receive support they simply do not receive from the existing Scottish enterprise model. So Labour very much supports this bill, and when we vote later today, we will support the principles of the bill. But we would like to see the legislation amended as it makes its way through the parliamentary process, making a number of significant improvements. Firstly, we believe the aims of the agency should be strengthened. Now, we appreciate the Cabinet Secretary says they've been drafted to provide a high level of flexibility. But we believe more direction is needed, including a focus on inclusive growth and a recognition of the demographic challenges the area faces. We also support the call from Community Land Scotland for the bill to include specific reference to community ownership. In their submission, they, they, they rightly highlighted the huge discrepancy across Scotland of the 560,000 acres of land in community ownership, almost 530,000 are in the Highlands and Islands compared to just 800 in the south of Scotland. So supporting community ownership should be a key aim of the new agency. We also believe that supporting the enhancement of transport networks and digital connectivity should also be a key aim. Now, I know the Cabinet Secretary did not share that view when he gave evidence to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, and he pointed out that other agencies had this role. Well, you could say the same about the proposed aim to enhance skills. Skills Development in Scotland, it could be argued, have that role. But I believe that ignores the leadership role the new agency should have. I want to see the agency take the lead, bring people together, drive the change we need to grow the economy of the south of Scotland and improving transport and digital infrastructure should always be at the heart of that change. In creating a new agency, we also have an opportunity to embed values and aspirations right from the very start, including the principle of fair work. In their submission to the REC committee, the STUC rightly called for the bill to be amended so the agency's aims included specific commitments on promoting collective bargaining and advancing fair work as defined by the Fair Work Convention. It also called for proper workforce recognition on the board of the new agency. Changes to the bill, Labour fully endorses. Finally, President Officer, if this new agency is to work effectively, it needs to be driven by and be accountable to the communities it serves. That was the overwhelming message from the people in the south of Scotland in submissions to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee and when the committee visited Dumfries and Gala Shields. The attendance and engagement, I think, at those events highlighted the real support for this new agency. Given evidence to the REC committee at one of those events in Dumfries, Dumfries and Galloway Council leader Elaine Murray noted, and I quote, the new agency will be accountable to ministers, but it does not say anywhere in the bill that it will be accountable to the people of the south of Scotland. In the same session, Professor Russell Greggs, the chair of the South of Scotland Economic Partnership stated, in the end, it is the people of the South of Scotland who should manage the new agency while a governing body runs it from day to day. In the response to the committee, the Scottish Government say that they support the principle of local accountability. But with ministers making decisions on the location of the headquarters, the first chief executive, the chair, the members of the, the board, the signing off of the action plan, the issue of direction, this principle isn't very obvious in the legislation as it is currently drafted. So I therefore hope that as this bill goes forward, it will be amended to include a clear legal requirement for the new agency to consult and report on performance to the most important people, and that's those with the biggest stake, the people of the south of Scotland. The new agency must be rooted in the south of Scotland. It needs to have the local membership, the budget, the powers required to deliver the real change the south of Scotland needs. And it must be an agency that is very much for the south and from the south. Thank you. Call John Finney for around six minutes, please. Um, thank you, President Officer. Uh, I, I think this Parliament's at its best when it's doing the scrutiny work in the committee, and uh, it, it's where we see the best collaborative work, and uh, there's no doubt that to the report uh, that we came up with, um, not everyone would agree with every word of it, but that's the very nature of it. We must try and find consensus. What there was unanimity on was that this was a very worthwhile piece of legislation, and uh, um, that's certainly the view of the Scottish Green Party of the supporting the general principles tonight. Um, and 
I, I've heard now from a couple of speakers that the south of Scotland felt forgotten. If that was a perception, or if indeed that was the, the reality for people, then it's certainly not the case now. Um, I was a bit confused at the third speaker. I thought Mr Carson had turned up inadvertently at the wrong debate. But after he, after he completed a lengthy list of demands of the public sector and then said, and I think I quote him correctly, too much public sector, I just realised it was a usual Tory contribution. So, um, one, of the things, one of the things that uh, was an issue and has been alluded to in a couple of the earlier comments was, um, and I had this written down at the top of my page, was where is the south of Scotland? Because there was a lot of debate about the scope of the bill, as it were. Um, and uh, the Hines and Islands Development Board, the predecessor of the Hines and Islands Enterprise, has the advantage of that it was the Crofton communities that was very much a, a, a binding together. And we did hear from representations from South um, Ayrshire and South Lanarkshire um, uh, about the needs the, the, of these communities. And of course, you can have a community of interest as well as a geographic community. And, and, but I, I think as we've heard from some of the speakers already, um, the border counties have a history of working together um, and the close association and long-standing links they have uh, with communities at the other side of the border, which are being um, strengthened at the moment, um, suggests, and the committee certainly took on board, that that was the appropriate um, uh, scope of the, the uh, agency. However, we do, did hear that uh, there is scope, and as happens with Highlands and Island Enterprise, where there is a, a common interest that exceeds beyond the geographic boundaries that support has given there. And indeed, in relation to this piece of uh, legislation, we, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, were assisting. Um, but of course, very typically, when we were in Dumfries, and I spoke to a great number of people there, people spoke about issues in Dumfries, just as people elsewhere, because everything is very local, and the measure of this bill will be um, how locals ultimately uh, gauge it. Um, there is a need for the agency. Um, it was mentioned by one of the previous speakers that it was in the manifesto. It was also in the Scottish Green Party manifesto. And what the REC report said about it, there's no doubt it's required. Um, and the creation, I think, is a very positive signal. And if one of the signals is that it's not a forgotten part of Scotland, then that will be uh, very positive. I was very interested to know the existing arrangements with Scottish Enterprise, and I, I would be very concerned if in any way this piece of legislation was letting them off the hook, so to speak, because they do have, a, 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 albeit, a, a limited role in the Highlands and Islands. And I think that's something going ahead that we will need to... To, to look at. The, the REC report said the agency should enhance the current support landscape, and clearly that includes Scottish Enterprise, rather than adversely impact on existing provision. So um, we heard from the Cabinet Secretary that this was informed by the people of the south of Scotland. The convener talked about the huge level of uh, support, and um, Colin Smith talked about the community uh, spirit that was there. And, and we did hear about the Sc South of Scotland Economic Partnership and the solid foundation that it put in place. And I think credit is due to Professor Griggs uh, and his team because it was quite apparent from everything that, that we heard that they were out and about and engaging. Now, the, the strength of Highlands and Islands Enterprise is it's very much its community links uh, and the aspect of social responsibility. And I think that's something where we will see um, a, 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 an uplift on it in the uh, uh, south of Scotland. Uh, this is not, and I was very keen as a, a, a proud Highlander and a representative of, a, of the Highlands and Islands, this is not a competition. This is not North versus South, Highlands versus uh, Lowlands. This is something that should be complementary. We are all very keen, uh, or I, we should all be very keen to ensure that any frailties in our communities are, as are addressed. There are huge differences, uh, not least land and land ownership and the traditional patterns. And it, that, that's what I'd like to, in the very brief time left, talk about. Dr. Callum McLeod, Community Land Scotland, I, I felt gave us a, a, an extremely interesting input um, where he said, and I quote, one of the South's interesting assets is land. Interesting because when compared to the relative um, amount of community ownership there is, and somewhere here I have the figures, um, 562,000 acres in community land ownership in Scotland, the vast majority in the Highlands and Islands. In Dumfries and Galloway in the Scottish border, 794 acres of land in community ownership. So um, Community Land Scotland argued that this would be one of the main barriers uh, lies in the cultural thinking and our thinking where opportunities lie. And I do recall the evidence that we received from 
Barbara Elborn, uh, Newcastleton and District Community Trust, when she said Newcastleton has recently taken on and established its own community assets. And that ownership has engendered a feeling in the community to drive things forward. And that's precisely what this legislation, I hope, will do in respect of community ownership, community transport, the community spirit that's been alluded to. And of course, there'll be a requirement for continuing engagement. It's very clear there's a need to, to collaborate. I don't think anyone wants to see duplication. That's why co-location is very important. This isn't about a new shiny headquarters. This is people sitting desks side by side and working for the benefit of the people of the, the, the uh, south of Scotland. The challenges, and they are noted in our reports, the demographics, wages, fragile communities, they exist, they will remain, but they need to be built on. And as regards a comment I heard about young people, we're losing young people. Well, the reverse is true in the, in the Highlands and Islands, and that's to be welcomed. So um, we'll be supporting the um, general principle of the bullet decision time tonight. Thank you. Call Mike Rumbles for round six minutes, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm very pleased to be speaking in this debate on behalf of the Liberal Democrats. And there's no doubt in my mind that there is a real need for a South of Scotland enterprise agency, one which is based in the South of Scotland for people who live in the South of Scotland. And I have to say that as an MSP representing the North East of Scotland, I'm somewhat jealous, if that's the right word, of, set, of the setting up of a new agency for the South of Scotland, uh, when I believe that such an agency for the North East would be of great benefit too. And I have no wish to add to the Cabinet Secretary's huge workload but perhaps it's an idea for a new Scottish Government bill in the future. The point about the new South of Scotland Enterprise Agency is that it doesn't replace Scottish Enterprise, but is complementary to it. However, this is perhaps where we need to look again at the way our agencies work together to achieve the aims being set out in this bill, and particularly look at the financial arrangements involved for each organisation involved in economic, social and environmental issues. Edward Mountain, our convener, of our committee said in his speech, he pointed out that the financial memorandum accompanying this bill anticipates a budget of around 42 million pounds. During the committee's visits to the region, there was much discussion, and there was, in our evidence sessions as to whether or not this 42 million pounds was new money and new investment for the region. It is a genuine uh, point, and I'm not trying to make a party political point, it's a general point that was raised by people that were giving us evidence they wanted to know. When the Cabinet Secretary gave evidence to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, he told us that the 42 million would indeed be the, bu uh, the budget of the agency in year three, and that it would be an increase in overall funding for the area. However, he wasn't able to say how much of an increase it would be. I do find this a surprising thing to say. I would have thought that if the Cabinet Secretary was able to say that it would be an increase in funding, he should logically therefore know what the funding currently is for economic development in the south of Scotland. Obviously, how, how could he... Yeah, I'm delighted. Yeah. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, notwithstanding the line of argument the member's developing, does he agree that if existing funding, the control of that is transferred to an agency based on the border, there is some benefit in doing that? Mike Rumbles. Well, there's obvious benefit, and I, I hardly concur with that. But the, the, uh, again, I'm making the point, I'm trying not to be party political about this, is the point that the people that we were taking evidence from, and, and, and um, the member was there, uh, how they were interested to in, know, oh, it, it's just genuinely an increase in funding, because some of the people that were involved in the current funding want to know whether their budgets are going to be cut, and it's a reasonable, it's a reasonable ask. The committee said in its report that, of course, yeah. Fergus Ewing. I think Mr. Rumble is making a fair point, and I will revert to the committee as I undertook to do so in due course. I'll just make the point that not the Scottish Enterprise is the existing economic agency uh, serving uh, the whole of Scotland, other than the HIE area. Uh, and not all of its expenditure is geographically identifiable. Much of its expenditure, presiding officer, relates to schemes which apply to the whole country. And therefore, in order to compute the precise amount of money which is attributable from the Scottish Enterprise budget to the south of Scotland, it's necessary to make an apportionment of that part of its expenditure which is nationally based. That's one complexity. Another is an awful lot of the expenditure which totaled 1.2 billion over to 17-18 applies to economic development but has not actually been within the grant of 
uh, Scottish enterprise, but from other agencies. So I'm just saying that in so many things, I'm afraid that government is more complicated than perhaps uh, uh, we would like. Yeah. Mike Rumbles. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I see you nodding your head there. Um, yes, I entirely accept what the Cabinet Secretary has said, and I just hope that some work is being done to be able to give us an estimate when we get to the committee of whether, uh, about this issue. So if I can now turn to the issue of ensuring broad representation on the Enterprise Board, which was also a particular concern for those people who gave us evidence on our visits to Dumfries and Gala Shields. Now, the Cabinet Secretary will, will be pleased to hear and that surprised me, actually, but I'm sure you'd be pleased to hear that there was little concern over the fact that Scottish ministers would be appointing board members. People seem quite happy with that. But there was concern about exactly, exactly how the Scottish government intended to ensure that there was a broad and representative board in place from the start. We were told that there were, for instance, 2,300 voluntary organisations of one kind or another in the region. That's a heck of a lot, and how difficult it would be for just one person to represent such wide and varying organisations. Additionally, others said that they wanted the board to do things differently, that they wanted the new agents to actually address economic, social, environmental and cultural issues, and if they did that, they would need to have grassroots accountability. So I'd like to ask the Cabinet Secretary exactly how he intends to ensure that he gets the membership of the board right. I know what his intentions are, but I, we'd like to know how he intends to ensure it and how he envisages the board being accountable to the local people that they serve. Now, this is not an easy thing to do, and I would appreciate more certainty on how this is going to be achieved. Now, presiding officer, this is a good bill, and I congratulate the Cabinet Secretary for bringing it forward. Uh, and it is one which the Liberal Democrats wholeheartedly support, and we look forward to voting for the bill at decision time and examining in detail some of the issues I've raised today when the bill returns to the committee at stage two, and I've kept just within my six minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rumbles. As is very, very typical, I do have some time in hand today. <laughs> so we move to the open debate. Uh, speeches of six minutes, please, but I can allow time, extra time for interventions. Uh, Maureen Watt, followed by Oliver Mundell. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Uh, I believe the proposal to create a bespoke South of Scotland Enterprise Board was in the manifestos of not only the Scottish National Party at the last Scottish Parliament elections, which is probably why the consideration of this bill at committee has benefited from a large degree of consensus from the outset, not afforded to many bills in this place. I too would like to thank the Clark Security Official Report and Broadcasting and all who made the official committee meeting in Dumfries such a success and thank all members of the public who turned up there and to the evening meeting in Gala Shields and to the witnesses who came before committee. Their input was very valuable to our deliberations. The wide interest should remind this parliament of how important it is for us to get out in a boot. We have already heard that the economy of the south of Scotland is unique and required its own agency and that more attention, and that the South of Scotland requires more attention than it perhaps has had. This is notwithstanding the fact that the, the current uh, Scottish Enterprise Agency account manages 107 companies in the region, 42 in Dumfries and Galloway, and 65 in the borders, and over the last two years has spent between three and five million annually in both grants and services, supporting companies headquartered in the area or headquartered elsewhere but have operations in the area. And we've heard too of comparisons with Highlands and Islands Enterprise and what they have been able to, to achieve. But the creation of the agency in and of itself is not a panacea, it is what it can do. Not everyone in the Highlands is satisfied with HIE, but it is based in the Highlands, covers the Highlands, is staffed by people who live in the Highlands and served by board members who have inter the interests of the Highlands very much at heart. And there have been many successes there. In taking evidence, I think there's been a, some degree of confusion of the role of Scottish enterprise vis-a-vis -vis other agencies. 
encouraging economic growth is the work of a number of agencies working together, whether it is Scottish Enterprise, Skills Development Scotland, the Scottish Funding Council and local authorities. And I'm pleased to see that in the south of Scotland, they have been coming together and working together. There is in some quarters also the notion that it, if, SSC, if Scottish Enterprise could attract a few big employers to the south of Scotland, all would be well. But I hope we've learned from recent history and indeed the current situation with Brexit, Brexit that inward investment, while very welcome, and SSC, Scottish Development International, works hard on this in the global world, that where companies come to hear from outside, we must remember that they can locate and will locate um, anywhere in the world. And it does, and these companies do carry a great uh, a degree of risk. Therefore, presiding officer, I hope that the new South of Scotland Enterprise Board will be a catalyst of growth of indigenous companies and on the wealth of resources in the region. In other debates in this place, we have increasingly talked about embedding the rural economy in everything we do. And I think this is absolutely vital if we are to recognise the huge contribution our rural areas make to our country in terms of the provision of food and drink, including water, climate change, protecting our environment and so on. And we have a great opportunity to do uh, that within this bill. For example, it, it puzzles me as a dairy farmer's daughter that in an area like the southwest, with its abundance of grass and increasing concentration of Scotland's dairy farmers in the area, that we do not see the emergence of companies like Mackey's in the northeast and Graham's in the heart of Scotland. Now I know we've got great Galloway. I know. Let me finish this point. I know we've great Galloway ice cream, but I'm sure that there are opportunities. Uh, in the area to develop and grow um, companies on the back of dairy products. I'll take um, Oliver, Oliver Mundell. Mundell. I, I, I thank uh, the member for uh, the point that she's, she's making and the importance of recognising indigenous uh, companies, but would she recognise Rones Dairy, uh, a number of cheese producers, uh, Arla in Lockerbie in my constituency, uh, and uh, the presence of uh, Scotland's college, Rural College and University has been an example of where the dairy industry is actually doing very well in the south of Scotland. Maureen Watt. Yes, presiding officer, I do that. And I, I said that I would be, we should build on, on that. But the fact is that too much of, of our milk still goes south of the border, border to be processed and to um, be made into other products. So I'm sure with a little encouragement and support from the new South of Scotland enterprise body and its partners, growth of similar, similar enterprises is possible. And we have seen from the National Council of Rural Advi Advisors that the drive and ambition is there amongst our young people in agriculture and other land-based enterprises. We just need the catalyst and focus for this to happen. Similarly, with its huge forest areas in Dumfries and Galloway and the borders, downstream activities are ripe to be developed, ripe to be developed locally. During our deliberations, mention was made of land ownership, and there's little doubt that in the Highlands and Islands area, community buyouts have been an opportunity for new thinking and new ways of working. And like Colin Smith, I would like to see this developed and opportunities for this to happen in the south of Scotland. Tourism is also ripe for growth, growth as more and more people see Scotland as a great destination. I congratulate my colleague Emma Harper in promoting the South West 300, not in competition to the, North East, to the North Coast 500, but as an enhancement to tourism in Scotland. And this should be a catalyst for tourism attractions and accommodation in the South of Scotland to improve their facilities to attract more tourists to the region. Many see the ageing population as a threat, but I'd rather see it as an opportunity as many older people have significant disposable income. And um, there are a number of areas where community enterprises are already building on this. Throughout our uh, evidence taking and deliberation, I was very conscious too that many businesses in the south of Scotland 
are in the low wage economy. It is vital that more businesses pay the living wage and more, and that fair work is at the heart of what they do. This in itself will uplift the whole economy as those, those living in the area have more disposable income. So uh, in conclusion, I, like John Finney, would congratulate uh, Russell Griggs on the basis that he's provided for the new enterprise. There are many in the south of Scotland have a can-do attitude rather than the woe of me attitude that we've heard from Finlay Carson. And I'm sure that the positive mental attitude that we have seen in the drive in the south of Scotland can be built on. And I like, look forward to considering this bill further at stage two and further. Oliver Mundell, followed by Joan McAlpine. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to speak in today's debate and even more pleased, if I may say so, that we've arrived at this point. The recognition from this Parliament of the unique interests and needs of the South of Scotland has been long overdue. And in this, the 20th year of devolution, it is pleasing uh, to finally see a level of recognition from both the Parliament and the Government uh, of the ambition of Dumfries and Galloway and the Scottish borders. And it is great, genuinely great, and greatly appreciated to hear members from across this chamber talking up uh, the potential uh, of the south of Scotland. Um, there is no doubt that the creation of this new agency, alongside the recently announced Borderlands Growth Deal, has the opportunity to reverse the economic fortunes of our region, and in many senses recognises for the first time the unique cross-border dynamics in the area, and uh, the fact that for my constituents, what happens in Carlisle is every bit as important as what happens here in Edinburgh, uh, or in, for that matter, in Glasgow. In doing so, it says that a one-size-fits-all approach undervalues and under-resources our communities and fails to capture the strength and potential we have as a diverse nation. It also, uh, I think, takes on board uh, the feelings that many have in the south of Scotland that we are distinct from the central belt and that remote and rural is not a term which only applies in the highlands or islands. Recognising that devolution was never just about centralising decision making uh, and that when it comes to these important decisions about the future of our economy, then local and regional views and perspectives really do matter. Beyond the geographical, uh, the other vital reason beyond, uh, for the creation of this new agency is to ensure that we have a high skilled uh, workforce and opportunities for young people. Uh, because just as we struggle in other rural and remote parts of Scotland, it's clear that in the south of Scotland, we have seen an exodus of young people. And without a vibrant economy that creates high skilled jobs and opportunities and has its eyes firmly set on the future, we stand no chance uh, of reversing this trend. Equally, we also need to ensure that the locally available skill set in so much as is possible matches with the needs of businesses who are there already and looking to grow and expand their operations. I don't want to spend too much of this speech focusing on the negative. This is a good news story. Mm -hmm. However, it would be remiss of me not to highlight to the Parliament and other members, uh, as the committee I think itself has concluded, that there is a strong feeling in the south of Scotland that Scottish enterprise has served our region poorly and has failed in some senses to meet the needs or perceived needs of the business community and local economy. Uh, yes, certainly. Mike Rumbles. The evidence that we received in the committee was that while that was true in Dumfries, it certainly wasn't true, and the convener I'm sure can confirm that, when we went to Gala Shields, because there were quite a number of people who were quite positive about Scottish enterprise. Oliver Mundell. I certainly um, appreciate the input from the member as the, the constituency member for Dumfries. Um, naturally, uh, my attention is focused uh, and my knowledge is, is, is best placed on, on what's happening uh, in my own community. Um, and there certainly is a feeling there that Scottish enterprise uh, are predominantly interested in large companies uh, and in companies uh, that create a large number of jobs. And in a local... Yes, certainly. Fergus Shewing. I mean, by its nature, Scottish Enterprise are interested in larger companies because the Business Gateway, which is operated uh, in the auspices of local authorities, serves smaller businesses. Um, however, um, wouldn't Mr. Mandel agree that the hard work of Scottish Enterprise and others contributed to the success which he welcomed in Annan, securing a, a promise of investment of £9 million and the 
secure future of 120 jobs. Isn't that an example of success by Scottish Enterprise and very hardworking individuals working for that company who I think deserve a bit of credit? Oliver Mundell. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take the member's point in, I think, the spirit that it's offered and would say uh, this. My experience since coming to this parliament is that Scottish Enterprise have failed uh, to identify that Youngs were planning to leave the site in Annan. They failed to identify in a timely manner that there were problems uh, in uh, Dumfries at Penman Engineering. Uh, they failed uh, on a number of other occasions uh, to really get on top of the problems that companies that do employ large numbers of people in the region uh, were facing. And they underestimated the importance uh, of those problems. And I think uh, that most people uh, living in the region do recognise that it is our small and medium enterprises that are going to be the engine room for growth. They are the people who are there already. They are the people that when the south of Scotland has been unfashionable uh, for governments of different political colours in this parliament across the last 20 years have kept going, kept working hard, who are dedicated, who care passionately about our economy and, and who, who love our region. They are the people who need to be supported by the government and saying that's, uh, that, that's a matter for council organisations with much smaller budgets and without the resources and expertise uh, of an enterprise agency, without that strategic overview across uh, the, the whole region, uh, d d doesn't match up with the ambition I feel uh, for, for my region. And that's why I'm pleased uh, that, uh, albeit uh, belatedly, the Scottish Government have come to share uh, the view of those who've been campaigning for this agency for the last uh, few decades. Uh, and I think today is about them. Uh, and I would want to uh, pay real tribute uh, to, to those individuals um, because this, this is their prize uh, for all their hard work. Um, and I think uh, that we've got to not lose sight of that. Um, and for me, um, I want to see something uh, that looks like Highlands and Islands Enterprise Agency. I think we're coming late in the south of Scotland uh, to the table, uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't get there. Uh, but I would issue uh, just one word of caution uh, on that Highlands and Islands Enterprise Agency um, has been around for a long time and I don't think that we can uh, expect the new agency to immediately uh, replicate that. I think the biggest challenge the new agency fits um, is, is, is one uh, of expectation management. Uh, I think people uh, are really ready uh, to see this step change. Uh, I hope uh, that we can uh, allow an agency and organisation to come together that can share uh, our ambition to grow and develop um, and uh, create an organisation that bangs the drum for our region and ensures a place-based approach that drives forward growth and ensures that our region is no longer forgotten. Thank you. Joan McAlpine, followed by Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, speak in this debate today and to welcome the new Enterprise Agency for the South of Scotland, and I welcome the committee's findings. Uh, I know in the debate so far that a number of comments have been made uh, about uh, the board of the future agency, and I would just maybe suggest that people look at what's happening at the moment uh, with the SOSET board, because I think that points the direction uh, of the, the future agency. Um, the SOSET board's been appointed by ministers and we have some really fantastic uh, local entrepreneurs and social enterprise activists on it. People like uh, Tracy Rowan uh, from a family dairy business in Galloway and Amanda Bergauer from Scottish Rural Action. And indeed, um, Sir, um, Professor Sir Russell Griggs himself, um, a resident of South Scotland. And uh, I regularly speak to members of the board, including uh, Professor Sir Russell Griggs, in fact, only this week I, I raised a constituency issue with him and uh, he got back to me right away on behalf of my constituent. Um, but he also, he also outlined a little bit about the direction of travel for SOSEP, which if members would bear with me, I think it would merit uh, quoting because I think it was very encouraging. Uh, he, he pointed out that the consultation work that they did uh, last year um, involved speaking to 90 businesses across the, the South. And he outlined some key themes uh, that emerged from that consultation on how uh, the significant amount of extra money that SOSEP has are being spent. Uh, the first one was supporting young people to learn new and different skills that they can't currently access in the South. And that was key to the significant grant given to the colleges um, for that kind of learning. Uh, the second thing was focusing on growing enterprises um, 
uh, in communities who have the ambition and desire uh, to grow and create new businesses and help existing businesses. And the third was an integrated public transport system um, was at the top of businesses lists. Um, and he intends to focus on that going forward. And that's particularly important for young people uh, accessing work and college. So I think, you know, like that kind of gives an example of how in touch uh, the current board of SOSEP is. And I think that bodes well for the future and the future agency. Now, since being elected to represent the South of Scotland in 2011, I have consistently raised the need to address its unique challenges. And in particular, when I sat on the Parliament's Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee in the parliamentary session from 2011 to 2016, I was repeatedly reminded uh, that many communities and businesses in the South felt that their needs required business support that was more tailored to Scottish companies. Um, these companies, uh, smaller companies, I should say, uh, these businesses may not grow in these rural areas as fast as a company in the city, but they're often the linchpin of the community, sustaining not just jobs, but schools, uh, the high street and smaller uh, businesses further down the supply chain. And these SMEs have found it hard to access support um, in the past, uh, not just public sector support, but challenges actually accessing uh, bank lending post-2018. That came up in the Economy Committee last session uh, a lot. Um, and again, another reason why a bespoke solution uh, is needed. And that's why I'm absolutely delighted that the SNP is delivering that bespoke solution. And it um, is focused on a community development approach that has been uh, pioneered so successfully by Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Uh, and al although this new uh, agency will, of course, be by and from the South, uh, while taking the best of what we have learned in HIE. And I'm also delighted that uh, we have the commitment um, from the Cabinet Secretary that uh, we will mirror in the South HIE's uh, capital spending per head. That's really good news. The South of Scotland, as has already been said, has a different and distinct rural economy with wide ranging and significant opportunities. It's a really beautiful area and it's played a long and important part in the history of the Scottish economy. It's nurtured our textile industry and its agriculture and forestry sectors are thriving and it has a growing tourism industry. And indeed the new Sea South Scotland campaign by Visit Scotland is another initiative that's happening in the region at the moment as a, as a result of action by this SNP government. And I was absolutely delighted uh, to host an event uh, about Sea South Scotland, co-host it with uh, uh, colleague Rachel Hamilton, MSP there. And I think we can all agree that the level of enthusiasm there really showed that things are happening in South Scotland. Um, and that's got to be good for the young people of the region. Um, as has already been said, support for the agency is echoed by people uh, right across the south of Scotland. Uh, the ma vast majority um, support it. And I particularly want to welcome the committee's finding that the new agency should build on the work of Scottish Enterprise in the South. Because I, you know, I recognise what some smaller businesses say and has been said by other members that, uh, that, that the high growth, the focus on high growth companies hasn't always been uh, appropriate for small family owned businesses in rural areas. However, we shouldn't take away from the fact that I also speak to large manufacturing companies in the South who are very happy with um, the support that they've got from Scottish Enterprise. Uh, and ju just, just one example actually recently that I was able to help with an intervention was uh, Jazz P. Wilson, a manufacturer of um, uh, harvesting equipment for the forestry industry uh, based in Dalbiti um, have been working closely with the government on developing the young workforce, hire a lot of local apprentices and uh, provide really high quality jobs. And I know that coming together with the banks and Scottish Enterprise have helped them develop their business so that they can have a proper sales um, office uh, in, the, in the company for their equipment, which is it doesn't just serve the forestry industry in the south of Scotland, uh, but all over Europe. And as a real example of an exporter um, uh, that is um, being helped by Scottish Enterprise in the south of Scotland. And I know that speaking to uh, the, the family that run that company, they were very keen that that level of expertise that they have 
appreciated its Scottish enterprise is continued with the new agency and I have absolutely no doubt that it will be. Um, so in conclusion, presiding officer, I know we've got to wrap up. I welcome the new agency. However, I would say it couldn't come a, bit, it couldn't come a, a more appropriate time given the challenges that the south of Scotland faces from Brexit. Um, no new agency can be a panacea for that, but I wish it all the best and I'm delighted to support it um, in Parliament today. Thank you. Claudia Beamish, followed by Alec Neil. Thank you, presiding officer. And I welcome the bill for the creation of the South Scotland Enterprise Agency. And I'm pleased that in their recent stage one report, the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee have also agreed the principles of the bill. Whilst not a committee member, of course, I am a, uh, South Scotland is in my region and I've taken this issue very seriously for, for a very long time. Um, and I'm very uh, particularly happy to see that the REC committee have recommended amending the, uh, the specific aim, I quote, to improve the amenity and environment to be supplemented at stage two of the bill, to make sp a specific relation to, I quote, the sustainable use of the environment. This recommendation is vital, and it is imperative that at stage two this goes through, and I, and I, wish, um, I wish the committee well with this. And with the further recommendations, I quote, for encouraging the development of sustainable economy supporting the enhancement of transport network and digital um, connectivity and supporting community land ownership and assets ownership. Um, and the unquote that these, I support uh, these being taken through in the bill. And Community Land Scotland actually pointed out recently um, the, the staggering figure that we've heard from other members today, that over half a million acres of land is community owned in the Highlands and Islands, and in contrast, Scottish Government estimates that a mere 794 acres of land in the south of Scotland are in community ownership. And let's remember that Dumfries and Galloway and the Scottish Borders, which will take part in this en new enterprise body, only form part of the south of Scotland. So it is a very low figure. Uh, for, since the outset of, um, of the possibility of a new um, specific South Scotland enterprise agency, I've argued that the new agency must have a social and environmental remit, and I'm really pleased that the REC committee have come to the same conclusion at stage one. However, it is disappointing that these were not initially included in the bill and shows perhaps a lack of so focus from this government on the, these very important issues. Um, one of the most important factors, um, as I've already highlighted and other members have, but I want to go into in a little more detail, is, um, is the issue of land justice, very important to Scottish Labour. And Community Land Scotland states, and this is a slightly longer quote, but I do think it really highlights the issue very well. So I'm going to read it, if people will bear with me, please. One of the most important factors in helping to nurture the growth of community land ownership in the Highlands and Islands was the creation of the community land unit in Highlands and Islands Enterprise in 1997. In the intervening period, it has provided invaluable technical, financial and capacity building support to community groups in terms of purchasing and managing land and other assets. A comparable service is vital for the south of Scotland to help kickstart an expansion in community ownership there similar to the surge that has occurred in such ownership in the Highlands and Islands over the last 25 years. And uh, I, I, I thank members for bearing with me while reading that. I, I do think it, was, it is a very important point in terms of community development in the South. Um, and it is indeed happening, but needs, needs more support. Last year, I met with Professor Russell Griggs, um, actually in Clydesdale, <laughs> uh, to discuss the good work of the SOSEP, uh, the partnership and was go was going th um, which were going through the consultation process that were carrying out at that point and discussed with him the need for better connected rural communities, which I'm sure we can agree on across this chamber, where good quality education and jobs can be prov provided in the community. And I was pleased to see the REC committee's uh, report address these issues in the purpose of the bill. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how the agency will also support cooperative development and uh, that being across the sector, so important in my region, and also the development of SMEs, something I so often hear about as a big challenge, um, not just the starting up of them, but the development of them. Um, as um, my colleague uh, Colin Smith has often argued, the tailored support that is needed. 
and uh, I, I recognise and welcome the assurances that were given to the REC committee uh, regarding the remit and boundaries of the new agency, uh, that it would be flexible on working um, across, uh, along its boundaries, uh, or, as highlighted by John Finney. Although it is no surprise, it would be of no surprise to anyone in this chamber that the less well-connected communities along the outside boundary of the proposed agency feel left out, such as Ayrshire and Clydesdale. I'm aware that these issues are addressed in the REC Committee report, and I accept the reasons for the boundaries being what they are, being coterminous with local authorities. However, I would point out to the Cabinet Secretary that few people in Clydesdale feel they're closely connected to Glasgow, and the idea that the Glasgow City Region deal is somehow a replacement is not going to put many of my constituents in Clydesdale at ease. Therefore, I call on the Scottish Government to do more to support these areas through Scottish enterprise, suffering the same real need for investment as the areas in the new agency um, geographical area, which are not going to get the same level of focused social remit report. I hope the Cabinet Secretary can answer some of these concerns in his closing remarks. I support the principles of the bill, as does Scottish Labour, and I welcome this important development for part of my region. Thank you. Alex Neil, followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I, like everyone else, welcome uh, the arrival of this bill, uh, and I think it, the way it is, it's an excellent proposal, as you would expect from Mr Ewing, uh, who has uh, got a great track record in bringing forward uh, visionary proposals for the economy. I think there are a number of points, though, that I would like to make that might differ from what other people have said, because I want to concentrate on what this agency can actually do uh, to galvanise the economies of Dumfries and Galloway and the borders. I think the first thing to say is we're not dealing with one homogenous economy in the south of Scotland. We're effectively dealing with two regional economies, uh, Dumfries and Galloway and the borders. And both of those economies, in terms of their external communications, tend to orientate towards the north and the south and sometimes the west in the case of the Fleece and Galloway and its connections to Northern Ireland, rather than to each other. And yet, one of the things we need to do in Scotland is that we need to invest in future in cross-country investment in roads and infrastructure to improve the connectivity uh, between the east of Scotland and the west of Scotland. Outside the central belt, the connectivity between the east and the west is much, much poorer than the connectivity running from north to south and south to north in Scotland. And the south economy, I will in a minute, and the south, and, and the south uh, of Scotland economy would benefit from that. And Brian Whittle's going to ask me, do I agree that the A77 from Air to Stranra should be dueled? Absolutely. Brian Whittle. Thank you, Mr. Neil. I, I, I refer the chair to the, 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 the answer the member gave just a moment ago. Thank you. <laughs> Alex Neil. <laughs> Not saying the Tories are always predictable, but there you go. Uh, no, there is a fundamental serious point here, presiding officer, and that is that the creation of this enterprise agency with the remit it has is absolutely essential to the regeneration of the south of Scotland economy, both in Fries and Galloway, and the borders and to make it genuinely a much more homogenous economy. But it will only succeed in the long run if there is a major, and I mean a major investment in infrastructure in both Dumfries and Galloway, I will in a minute, Dumfries and Galloway and in the borders. Uh, now, if you look at, just take one example, Cairn Ryan Port, the single biggest port in Scotland. Uh, the A77, uh, is a disgrace south of air. And the idea that we could grow the Cairn Rhine to its full potential without dueling the A77 is just nonsensical. That is a prerequisite. It cannot be done tomorrow morning, but what I would suggest is that to support this, the work of this enterprise agency and the local authorities and all the key players, there should be a south of Scotland 15 to 20 year national infra infrastructure investment plan. And that should foresee major road improvements, the A77, the A75, the A76 on the Dumfries and Galloway side, the A1 and numerous other roads 
in the borders. And, and we should that include east-west connections, of course. John Finney. President officer, I am, I'm grateful for the member taking an intervention and I would share his view about east-west connections. But would he acknowledge that with four of the parties in this chamber committed to £6 billion expenditure on two roads, none of that's realistic? Alex Neil. I was told when it was the Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure by officials it wasn't realistic to plan to duel the A9 and duel the A96. We're going to have the A9 done by 2025 and the A96 duel between Inverness and Aberdeen by 2030. And it took an SNP government to actually do that because it was promised for many years but never delivered. Mr Carson. Finlay Carson. I, I thank the member for taking the intervention. Given that there's going to be a review of the infrastructure, road infra rail infrastructure in, in the south of Scotland published very soon, would the member agree with me that any uh, identification of uh, projects that are uh, important to bring forward quickly, that the whole project can be accelerated ahead of the National Strategic Transport Review? Alex Neil. Yeah, my, my view is very simple and straightforward, and that is to unleash the full potential of the south of Scotland economy, both in Fries and Galloway and the borders, we need a major, I've given, I've given away enough, uh, we need a major upgrade in infrastructure, primarily transport infrastructure. I've said that that has to be done over a 15 to 20 year period for the very reasons Mr Finney suggested, and that is the resources are just not there to do it in the shorter term. But if there are shorter term opportunities, then we should seize them as quickly as we possibly can. Because without the transport infrastructure, economic development relies on modern transport hubs. It relies on modern infrastructure. And if we cannot get that investment for modern infrastructure, we will not realise the full potential that can be delivered by this agency and more widely by the south of Scotland economy. The second point I wanted to make is in relation to the remit of the agency, and Joan McAlpine touched on this. One of the reasons, one of the major reasons why the HIDB and then HIE has been so successful in the last 54 years is because unlike the SDA or Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise always had a social and community development remit and to regenerate our rural communities, particularly remote rural communities, we need that combined remit. And I very much welcome the fact that the government has given this agency the same kind of remit as was given in 1965 to the Highlands and Islands Development Board. And the final point I would want to make, uh, presiding officer, is in relation to the role of this agency and where it can add real value. And it seems to me there are two broad areas. One is there are many indigenous resources, the people, the land, to mention two, forestry, uh, uh, tourism in, in both in Fries and Galloway and in the borders, where the potential has come nowhere near being realized. So if you like, the broad remit, number one, is where there are these existing industries and potential, let's exploit them much more to the full. But the second one is that we need to grow much more of new high-tech type industries in these areas as well. If we're going to raise the wages, if we're going to raise the value added, if we're going to raise the business startup rate, we need to be talking about the industries of tomorrow, uh, and that means going into the tech area, and the, again, without going into too much detail, presiding officer, because I'm just finishing, uh, then that is another area where both of these areas, the Fries and Gallery and the Borders, have huge potential that's been grossly under-realised up until now. Thank you. Michelle Ballantyne, followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I'm pleased to be representing my party and my constituents in this debate on the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill. Because, as has been mentioned, the bill set, sets, seeks to set up a new public body with the aim of encouraging economic growth, business development and employment in the borders. Now, I declare an interest in the sentence that 30 years ago we came back to the borders to do just that. 
And we were greeted then by an arrangement called the SDA, Scottish Development Agency, which was basically a couple of men in, in um, a small building, a temporary building. And I have to say, they were excellent. Um, they were persuasive, they were very helpful, they were very active. And we went on to build our business in the borders and it continues to thrive there. Over 30 years, we saw a lot of changes. We've seen a lot of changes with Scottish enterprise coming in, the remit of Scottish enterprise changing. And as a member of the South of Scotland Economic Partnership, during my time as a councillor, we had a lot of discussions around what we really needed in the South of Scotland. And we all agreed, that no matter who you were, whether you were there as a business representative, whether you were there as a political representative, the one thing we all agreed on, we needed an agency that was South of Scotland centric. Someone who has actually understood what we needed, looked at what was going on, worked closely with enterprises, small, medium, large, and didn't have a focus that was just about a national strategic interest. So I think from a cross-party point of view, we are all going to support this. And as it goes through its various stages, I hope that the discussions that we have will be very much focused on what's best for the south of Scotland. But the Scottish Borders and Dumfries and Gallery are regions with a particular set of economic challenges, and, and speakers so far have highlighted some of these. And therefore, it, it does make it particularly well suited to sustaining a local body that is dedicated to inclusive growth. But I want to say that I am very heartened by the amount of investment that has gone in to the south of Scotland recently, and that's by both the UK and the Scottish governments. Um, and I hope that we won't get to a stage where we're arguing about who's done what and who's most important, because I think that then belittles what is being done. Um, and it is really important. The next decade will see the Borderlands Growth Deal and £150 million of funding dedicated to the Scottish borders. And I'm hopeful that a South of Scotland enterprise will be at the forefront of assisting businesses and local groups with managing this investment, however it's allocated. There has been much made of the economic challenges facing us um, in the South of Scotland. And I think the new enterprise agency will be adept at highlighting local issues. But there are several areas where I, I particularly want to see a bit of a focus. One of the biggest areas of concern, certainly in the Scottish borders, is digital connectivity. And it's no secret that the Scottish borders is lagging behind when it comes to superfast broadband rollout. In fact, borders' access to superfast broadband is 10% below the national average. As it currently stands, the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill doesn't include any powers over digital co connectivity. However, if business innovation and competition are to be treated holistically by the South of Scotland Enterprise, then it would seem somewhat remiss not to mention digital connectivity in, in amongst it. And I do appreciate, yeah, in one second, because I'm going to say that I do appreciate that Cabinet Secretary for Rural Economy does not want the new agency to be lumbered with the expectation of solving digital connectivity problems for which it's going to lack the budget. But I am concerned that the lack of reference to digital connectivity will leave the South of Scotland enterprise hamstrung when trying to attract or assist new businesses, especially those that seek to break into the new technology industry, which Alec Neil talked about. Fergus Ewing. I, I certainly agree with the member that digital and physical connectivity, as Mr Neil said, are, are both absolutely key to economic development. But I just wanted to point out, presenting officer, that a, a sum of £133 million has been earmarked uh, to improving connectivity and, in particular, access to superfast broadband at a level of, I think, 30 megabits per second uh, under the R100 scheme. And that's entirely separate from the work the Scottish Government is doing in South of Scotland Enterprise. I mean, I, I would have thought that everybody, including the Scottish Tories, would welcome £133 million investment in the South of Scotland in providing access to superfast broadband with the aim of doing so very quickly indeed. Michelle Ballantyne. Well, I mean, I think, Cabinet Secretary, the point here is not about not welcoming what's been done. We do welcome what's been done. This is the point about joining up the thinking around it and not putting it all into silos, because you can't have enterprise development without digital connectivity embedded in that. So there must be good connections and there must be a role for South of Scotland Enterprise who's trying to encourage enterprise, who are trying to um, attract and work with 
industry and, and new businesses that want to perhaps go into technology in terms of where it's sitting. If they're just having to, to you know, talk about it and say, oh, well, that's, that's some other organisation that does that, I can tell you now, businesses won't be impressed. We, we don't want to have to go door to door to find out about each element. We want to be able to work with the local agency and the local agency needs to be able to cover all aspects. Now, <laughs> that kind of brings me on nicely to an, my other point, which is around ensuring that the borders can cultivate and, and Dumfries and Galloway can cultivate and retain a young workforce. Several members have already talked about the difficulties around that. And the Scottish border certainly has an ageing population with over 65s accounting for almost a quarter of borders residents. But that won't be sustainable unless we can have young people there who, who are developing businesses who can then support the provision of services. So combined with out high levels of outward mi migration for young people, it means that we have to work even harder in the south of Scotland to ensure that a young skilled workforce is retained and that young workers find moving to the borders and Dumfries and Galloway an attractive prospect. So for that reason, again, I'm keen to see that the South of Scotland enterprise work with existing employability groups that are already active. Because if they don't, if they just set up on a, on a new line, A, we're going to lose the benefits of a lot of good work that's already been done. So that, for example, in the textile industry where they are developing their own training programs because they're having difficulty attracting people within agriculture, within the schools that are making good links, the, the rural college that's there, the rural university. The South of Scotland enterprise needs to become embedded with them, not come in again over the top. So we need to ensure that actually we have that good connection because as we've heard already, we are in danger of creating too many Draw groups tables, and therefore we don't then work effectively. So I think it's fair to say that we're all welcoming what's happened. We're all supportive of the general principles but always, as always, the devil will be in the detail. And the real test will come when determining the organisation of South of Co Scotland Enterprise, where it will be based, how it will be funded. And this bill provides a real chance to shape the economic future of the South of Scotland. And to make the most of this chance, we need to create an agency with teeth that has the power okay. and the connections necessary close, to support the South of Scotland, not just for now, but for the future. Most of the additional time has now been used up. So if I could ask those following to be a bit more careful about time. Stuart Stevenson, followed by Rhoda Grant. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, as the committee proceeded with this bill, it was an absolute delight to have the opportunity to visit the south of Scotland. Um, my personal connections with the area are extremely limited. Um, my grandfather was married in Eyemouth on the 2nd of May, 1890. Um, but he came from West Lothian and his wife came from Northumberland. I've no idea how that happened. Um, my first visit was on the 20th of January, 1952, uh, when my age five, when my father was preaching at the church in Leetham. Uh, and uh, in the late 1960s, uh, Maureen Watt may be interested to know, I had the first yoghurt in my entire life uh, while standing on the harbour at Kipford while participating in the Scottish OK dinghy sailing uh, championships. I didn't do too well in the championships, but I did enjoy uh, the yoghurt. But, uh, but, but I think there are a number of things that have come up in the debate. Um, Alec Neil properly identified that the border area that's covered by the new agency is not simply one cohesive, homogeneous area. Uh, we found as a committee, when we visited Gala Shields, we got a very different response to what was going on from that which we got from Dumfries. Now, I'll immediately say that Gala was substantially easier to get to. We got on the train, we went down to Gala Shields, we walked and got a taxi uh, to the venue, and we were able to return on the train in the midweek evening. Whereas Dumfries, uh, I think if the committee had not previously realised the important need for infrastructure investment, um, the journey to Dumfries, for me, 
from the north of Scotland perfectly illustrated uh, that uh, need. I, I couldn't actually persuade myself that I could get back from Dumfries to Linlithgow, where I have my house when I'm here, uh, in the evening. So I had to drive from the north of Scotland all the way down to Dumfries and then drive back to Edinburgh. And that was a minor inconvenience on a single occasion for me, but for those who live and work there, it perfectly illustrates uh, the need uh, for investment. So travel, important point where I think there's a consensus of the need uh, to do something about that. And the new agency can take a lead in promoting that, working, of course, with the Regional Transport uh, Partnership. Now, we've uh, talked quite a lot about Highlands and Islands enterprise. I think uh, it's myself and Kenny Gibson are the only constituency members here whose constituencies cross the boundary into Highlands and Islands, uh, as well as uh, being in, uh, in Scottish enterprise area. In my case, 15% or thereabouts of my electors are in the Highlands and Islands enterprise area. And it's quite marked when you're exposed to the two as a constituency member, how different the priorities and modes of operations are. And I think we're right to look at the way that Highlands and Islands enterprise operates as the model uh, for the south of Scotland. Um, it, it's quite clear that uh, in particular, the emphasis on uh, social responsibility and social enterprises is very important. Um, Highlands and Islands Enterprise uh, make, uh, in their documentation, they talk about supporting social enterprise and community-led development and if, uh, through their uh, community account management program. Now, I don't say that program should be lifted unchanged to the borders, but it certainly looks like something uh, that's worth having a look at because it seems that one is likely to be dealing with similar problems to those which originated, were present at the times of the Highlands and Islands Development Board, then HIE. But of course, the Highlands area now has Inverness that has fundamentally been transformed in the 50 or so years since my wife left there, because that's her home territory, and is now a very significant regional conurbation with strong economy, leaving a lot of the Highlands still in a place of needing support. Dumfries has no equivalent to Inverness, but we might hope that the intervention of the, the new body might, uh, might get us uh, there. Now, the way that Highlands and Islands Enterprise works is fundamentally different. Uh, it has a different account management structure that reaches much closer to community bodies and to small enterprises in a way that Scottish enterprise uh, is not uh, focused on that. And the fact that uh, incomes are lower in the in the uh, border areas is a key indicator uh, of the need to do uh, what is proposed here. Uh, it's important too that we look at con helping communities make their own decisions. And again, uh, that is something that uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, they say, allowing community account management to help communities identify and realize their aspirations. In other words, not centralised decision-making in the Highlands, telling people what to do, and we don't want that uh, model in the, in, the, in the border counties either. Just a few words about the board. I, I think it's very important that when we look at the constitution of the board and the way it works, that we have strong lines of accountability from the board back to its communities and strong channels for inputs from communities to allow the board to be demonstrably responsive to them. That's quite different from the idea of a board that is representative. I actually want people with the greatest skills. I do want people who understand and preferably live in the area that is concerned. But I want people who are not there simply as a representative, but as there for the skills and can sustain accountability uh, and responsiveness. Uh, Thank you. officer, I'm no. happy to support this at decision Thank you. time. I hope others Thank do so Thank you very so much. Well. I call Rhoda Grant, followed by John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We in the Scottish Labour Party welcome this bill and it's been a long time coming, but I truly hope it brings to the south of Scotland the economic focus it needs. I cover the Highlands and Islands and feel that we have a constant battle to be heard. Centralisation devastates our communities and sometimes government treats us with a degree of arrogance that we'd normally expect from absentee landowners. 
I fight against this every day and put forward the case for my region. Imagine then my surprise when speaking to people from the south of Scotland that they look on us in the Highlands and Islands with envy and perhaps a touch of resentment. We have our own enterprise body, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, and while they have not had a focus on their economic needs and they often feel ignored by Scottish enterprise, as their needs appear paltry compared to large centres of population. Therefore, for them getting their own enterprise company is a step in the right direction. However, it must have the same powers and breadth as Highlands and Islands Enterprise. The committee seemed relaxed at the lack of compulsory purchase powers, but I'm not. I believe that there is an advantage in holding those powers because the, the, the holding of them is as powerful as the power itself. And Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise have never used their compulsory purchase powers, but neither have we measured the impact that holding those powers has. And does the knowledge that those powers exist bring people to the table? There are other powers omitted from the bill and I would ask that they be added at stage two. For example, the power to enter land and the power to acquire information. These powers are important in order to allow South of Scotland Enterprise to regulate those it has provided support to. It's also important that South of Scotland Enterprise has the same social remit as Highlands and Islands Enterprise, because this allows them to take a more holistic approach. And I believe that's really important in rural areas. Working with com communities is as important as working with big business in these areas and community ownership also needs to be a priority for them. I noted with interest the wishes of the community um, which were echoed by Community Land Scotland about accountability of the board and who should select them. And there has been a tendency by this government to choose yes men on their boards when the very existence of Highlands and Islands Enterprise was challenged. There was not a squeak from the board and I'm pretty sure that would have not happened in Jim Hunter's day. Therefore, I understand the wishes of the community to have their say on who is selected and would ask the Cabinet Secretary to, do, to look at this and see how the community could be involved. Evidence to the committee also suggested the involvement of young people, and I believe that to be right because we are talking about their future. Too many young people from rural areas are forced away from home just to access education and a career. And if we're to build an economy in the south of Scotland, then young people need to be at the heart of that. I would also like to see a commitment to 50-50 gender balance on the board from the outset. It's a new board. We don't have to wait for a transition. And I hope the Scottish Government start the way it means to go on. And we must also, as other speakers have said, see a commitment to fair work. Those who receive assistance and grants from the South of Scotland Enterprise must commit to fair work practices. While the new agency is very welcome, the Scottish Government also have tools at their hands to stop the economic decline and depopulation of rural areas. They have to step away from their centralisation agenda. And th this has done untold damage to our rural areas, removing high quality jobs and therefore having a disproportionate impact on these economies. It also disempowers these areas when decision makers are removed to urban areas and we end up with urban decisions because of that. The government have taken forward a Community Empowerment Act and an Islands Act, but their style of management flies in the face of these aspirations, and until they loosen their grip on power, we will see continued centralisation. Procurement is also at the heart of this. Centralised contracts have no protection for small and medium-sized enterprises. The Federation of Small Business this report, Broken Contract, Smaller Business and Scottish Procurement, points out that despite the Procurement Reform Act of, 19, of 2014, small, bus small businesses are not winning any more contracts. And the truth is, they're actually receiving far less. The number of small and medium-sized enterprises supplying goods and services to the Scottish Government has halved under the SNP. In a letter to Jackie Bailey, the Finance Secretary confirmed 1,502 SMEs supplied the Scottish Government in 207, uh, 208, but that figure has fallen to just 716 um, in 2017-18. 
Colin Smith um, said South of Scotland Enterprise hosts a large number of SMEs and it is important we support them because they provide us with a far greater return. We have a vested interest in their communities and are much less likely to leave. It also means that they're likely to spend their money and procure goods in these same areas and therefore this decline must be turned around. Presiding officer, these are things that the government can address now and that would have a disproportionate impact on the economy of our rural areas and I hope they act on that now. Thank you very much. I call John Mason to be followed by Brian Whittle. Mr Mason, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and I'm very happy also to be supportive of this bill. It's clear that HIE is highly thought of in the Highlands and Islands, and that was particularly seen when the suggestion was made that there might be some amalgamation of enterprise bodies covering the whole of Scotland. I do agree there is, uh, there's a need for a more joined-up approach to the whole enterprise and skills sector, but not going as far as amalgamation. So hopefully the strategic board will give that coordination without the regional and other bodies losing their identities. There certainly do seem to be a lot of similarities between the Highlands and Islands and the south of Scotland. Both are largely rural, are at some distance from the central belt, have seen young people drifting off to the cities and not returning, and have had difficulty attracting new businesses or growing existing ones. So I do very much agree that there's a strong argument for a new south of Scotland enterprise body, I would confess that the south of Scotland can sometimes be overlooked by those of us in the central belt. If you say where in Scotland is there a big area with a sparse population, beautiful scenery and opportunities for getting away from it all, I think many of us would think eh, of the north first rather than the south. Yet the reality is all of these are true for the south as well. The committee carried out two visits to the south of Scotland, as others have said to Dumfries and Gala Shields. And I felt these were very useful visits with good turnouts at both. There were very engaged audiences with a real enthusiasm for the new agency. There were one or two folk who did question the need for a new agency with the risk of increased bureaucracy and money being spent on administrative costs rather than frontline services. However, my feeling certainly was that that was very much a minority. There were questions raised about how much Dumfries and Galloway had in common with the borders, and Alec Neil touched on this. And it's true that there are significant differences. At least parts of the borders have a very strong link with Edinburgh and reasonably good transport, while Galloway is considerably more remote. As was said already, the committee was able to travel to and from our evening meeting in Gala Shields by train. That would not have been possible if we had gone to Stranra. It's also true that east-west links across the south of Scotland are not strong and many people may not think of it as one region. However, overall, there, I think there are a lot of common strengths and weaknesses and it seems wise to have one agency for the two council areas. Another factor discussed was whether the new agency should cover a wider area than just the two councils. Clearly, there are similar challenges in South Lanarkshire and the south of Ayrshire, but boundaries have to be drawn somewhere and I'm afraid often are artificial. So I personally am comfortable with the proposal that the new agency's boundaries will match the two existing councils. Concerning the existing work and profile of Scottish Enterprise, the people we met in Dumfries had little good to say about them, it has to be said. However, to be fair, the gathering in Gala Shields was more positive, with a show of hands indicating a dozen or so businesses that had had involvement with Scottish Enterprise, and most of them were positive. But to be fair to Scottish Enterprise, I do not think on their budget that they can give the same level of pers personnel or financial support to a more rural area with smaller enterprises as HIE can do to the Highlands and Islands. So fundamentally, that is why we need this new agency. The relationship with existing agencies such as Scottish Enterprise was another question which came up several times. And I think there's a lack of understanding that SE has a national role for certain specific tasks, but would not get involved on the ground in the routine work in the South in the future. Maybe there needs to be some work done on clarifying these roles. And linked to that is the question of the strategic board the board is not set up in statute and in many ways is still settling into its new role. So it's difficult to define too specifically what the relationship will be between the new agency and the board. However, I think we can make some general assumptions about that and I agree it is probably not appropriate to refer to the strategic board in this bill when it does not appear in other legislation. The comparison with HIE was an underlying theme throughout the committee's work on the bill and I said before there were clear similarities between the North and the South. 
However, that then raises the question as to whether the funding per head in the two areas should be the same. That is what the government is proposing and the committee agreed with that. Now, I do accept that there may be some catching up to do because HIE has been in existence for five decades and the south of Scotland has not had that input. However, I have to say I am not entirely convinced that funding per head in the south should be the same as for the highlands and islands in the longer term. Firstly, the distances in the highlands are much greater and people are living in more remote areas. As Colin Smith himself said, people in the south live within two hours of 14 million people. That is not true of the highlands and islands. Uh, Mr I've Mason is in yes. his last minute. No, I, uh, is that, I'm not allowed to, sorry. Uh, I'm sure I'm having to discuss it with you and I'm sure this point will come up in the future. Uh, and, and the other point with HIE is that it covers many islands which the south does not have. The Islands Act, which our REC committee also dealt with, requires that we should take into account islands when making any decisions, including about funding. The fact that there are so many islands in the HIE area would suggest that they need higher funding. And I find it a bit strange that HIE is to get no extra funding to take account of its islands. However, I do also note that it's equivalence in the budget initially, and presumably there will be a review in the longer term. Therefore, in conclusion, I'm delighted to support this bill, which will mean a third enterprise body to work alongside SE and HIE. Of all the bills I've been involved with, I think this is one that has probably had the widest level of agreement. So hopefully that will continue and we'll see a real boost coming to the economy and well-being of this important part of our country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mason. I call Brian Whittle to be followed by Emma Harper. Ms. Harper is the last speaker in the open debate. Mr. Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'm delighted to be able to speak uh, in this debate today because uh, this is an important bill and debate because as we heard today from across the chamber, the south of Scotland and specifically the south west has long been the forgotten part of Scotland when it comes to investment from the Scottish Government. The regional region certainly has its challenges with a low uh, GVA against the Scottish average. Average earnings are 10% lower than the Scottish average. I think the business start-up rate is considerably lower than the Scottish average as well. Small businesses account for a greater share of employment and income compared to Scotland as a whole, with more people being self-employed. Yet it has so many strengths, Deputy Presiding Officer, not least being its own natural environment, the quality of life, and it's steeped in cultural heritage. Unsurprisingly, therefore, the sectors that are important to the region currently include tourism, agriculture, forestry, and fishing. The South of Scotland Enterprise Agency potentially offers a fantastic opportunity for a long-awaited shot in the arm for the area. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, I want to focus my time uh, on the Scottish Conservatives' call for the agency to have the flexibility to work outside of its geographical boundaries and collaborate across agencies. And I would welcome any commitment from the Cabinet Secretary in his summary uh, as to the government's position uh, in this regard. The proposed enterprise zone uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, is surrounded by three growth deals worth in, uh, around £1.5 billion. We have the Borderlands Growth Deal, we have the Ayrshire Growth Deal, and we also have the Belfast Regional City Deal. And I include Belfast uh, because it is directly connected by the port of Cairn Ryan, through which some £1 billion worth of goods flow, including about 45% of Northern Ireland exports. Now, that is a significant investment that should be a key element of any strategy which aims to regenerate the region's economy. If the three growth deals had an element of collaboration, along with the potential of the proposed South of Scotland Enterprise Agency, real benefit could be realised. For a start, this investment, coupled with the business confidence that it might bring, would certainly go a long way to encouraging business start-up. I know this is an area in which uh, Scottish Enterprise and SIB have expertise in helping to develop. Their EIS and SEIS schemes, although evolving since, uh, since I was last involved, can still significantly influence inward investment. These schemes allow Scottish Enterprise to invest in a company and take a shareholding in a company under the same investment protocols as private investors. So not only do private investors get the confidence that a government agency is backing a new start business with all the advice and expertise they bring to the table, uh, they also receive significant tax breaks if they leave their investment with the new start company for at least three years. So along with their loans and grants scheme, Scottish Enterprise can help to ensure there is appropriate funding for any new start or developing business, as well as giving them access to the very best of its business advice. 
So we need to encourage more would-be entrepreneurs, risk takers and job creators to consider the south of Scotland as a destination. And I would encourage early interaction with uh, the Scottish Enterprise to seek the help they can give. And I think this is where the new enterprise agency can help to drive that kind of interaction. I want to return to Belfast, if I can. Uh, I, I travelled across during the last parliamentary recess to meet with politicians of all political persuasions, as well as business leaders, to discuss how both countries can increase the trade between them. After all, uh, as we've heard today, the, the biggest port in Scotland, the third biggest in the UK, is at Cairn Ryan, and it connects us with the Belfast Harbour. Stena invested £240 million and P&O invested £90 million in Cairn Ryan on the promise by the then First Minister Alex Salmond that the crumbling transport infrastructure in the South West would be appropriately upgraded. That was in 2010 and that promise remains unfulfilled. The horrendous state of the trunk roads, uh, the A75 and A77, trunk roads that connect the Cairn Ryan ports with routes south to England and on into Europe as well, into the, as, well as into the Scottish Central Belt is nothing short of a scandal. And that's not mentioning the A76 as well. Now, Alec, Neil has mentioned this as well, and I gently remind him that during the intervening time, he has been Transport Minister. So I do agree with him, but he had the opportunity to do something about it. And what I did hear from the Northern Ireland... I, I will take the... I will take the question. John Finney. Thank you. I, I understand the, the concerns there are about infrastructure. Would the member recognise that there can be considerable benefit derived if that infrastructure that's put in place is rail rather than road as well? Brian Whittle. Uh, th I can thank the member for that intervention, and I do I definitely agree with that, and I'm actually going to come on to that, that, that rail infrastructure as well uh, is important there. But what I did hear from the Northern Ireland politicians and uh, business leaders, they confirmed that the, the, the South West infrastructure, or the lack of it, is having a negative impact on the Northern Ireland economy uh, as well. So today, you know, we have only had an outline commitment of £30 million to build a long-awaited Mabel bypass still to be started despite many assurances from the Scottish Government. And this compares to the £3 billion investment proposed in the A9 upgrade. That's 100 times the investment so far proposed uh, for the whole of the south-west of Scotland. So, Deputy Secretary Officer, what I would say is we can't look at developing and sustaining the economic prosperity of the south of Scotland through the prism of, of a new enterprise agency alone. Hence, using my time in this debate to focus on the absolute requirement that the new South of Scotland agency has that flexibility to work outside of its geography uh, and, and to interact across the agency. And furthermore, I would suggest that there's a, a big need to work across portfolio. So in conclusion, we, we agree in these benches there is a great potential in the establishment of the enterprise agency for the South of Scotland. However, this is just one piece of a jigsaw, and I would urge the Scottish Government to consider a much more holistic approach to addressing the long-term lack of investment in the south of Scotland and ensure its sustainable economic Thank you. health. Thank you. Thank you. I call Emma Harper, last speaker in the open debate. Move to closing speeches after that. Ms Harper. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak in this afternoon's Stage 1 proceedings of the importance of the South Scotland Enterprise Agency Bill. This bill is welcome and needed to benefit my South Scotland region, its businesses, its people and its towns, villages and rural areas. And I'm pleased to have been involved in this process. I attended the Rural Economy and Connectivity Evidence Session in Dumfries at Easterbrook Hall and I have attended various events for the Interim South Scotland Economic Partnership, having met with its chair, Russell Griggs, as well as board members, formally and informally, to hear about the, the work that they have been taking forward. And I've also been able to support the South Scotland Economic Partnership through writing to the Scottish Government about the positives and negatives to ensure that the new agency and associated legislation is strong. The stage one report from the committee states that the committee is in no doubt, and I think we're in no doubt across chamber today, that the creation of a South Scotland Economic partnership is required and that the agency which is now being debated is absolutely essential for the region. The committee supports the general principles of the bill and recommends to Parliament that they agree, be agreed to. And I know that this will be extremely refreshing for people across the south of Scotland and I certainly hope members across chamber will join me in echoing their, these remarks today. 
Presiding officer, I'd like to start by giving some context as to how the idea of the South Scotland Enterprise Agency first came about. And just to remind everybody that in 2016, the First Minister announced a review of enterprise and skills bodies across Scotland to allow the government to better meet its objective of seeing a vibrant economy. And it was agreed in terms of reference for the review that it would have the objective of allowing for a transformational step change in performance for a range of economic outcomes. The review process identified several challenges facing the economy of the Dumfries and Galloway and Scottish Borders areas, and members have spoke about this already. An older population with an out-migration of young people, relatively low levels of productivity and GDP growth, transport and digital con connectivity challenges, and I'll com come on to that as well, because I think it's really important, higher concentrations of low-paying, lower-skilled sectors, and several fragile communities across the region, and relatively low levels of private sector investment, research and development. I'd like to highlight a few of these challenges which both constituents and businesses across the region have conveyed to me that they feel are the main barriers to the region flourishing. The region does have poor transport infrastructure, and as members will know, this is something that I have lobbied the Scottish Government for in my time here, as well as other members across chamber, bringing forward members' debates to highlight the need for greater investment on the main arterial routes, the A75, the 76 and 77, which do connect South Scotland and Northern Ireland, as well as North England and the wider Scotland. And this was highlighted quite eloquently by my colleague, Alec Neill. Last summer, I hosted a meeting in Stranraer, which the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity attended. It was made clear at the meeting by businesses, including Sten and P&O ferry companies and different local action groups, that to attract investment, business and people to the region, transport infrastructure must be improved. This is imperative. I'm therefore pleased to see that in the committee's report, the request to look at transport infrastructure, in addition to the South Scotland Strategic Transport Review, the findings of which are set to be published soon, is part of the committee's uh, asks. I would ask the, Scot uh, the Cabinet Secretary for a commitment that improving transport infrastructure across the South Scotland is a priority for the Scottish Government and will be part of the new Enterprise Agency's remit. In addition to these challenges, the Scottish Government's consultation also recognised several strengths and assets enjoyed by the area. These include a strong community spirit, characterised by a high degree of cohesion, resilience and commitment to the local area. A natural environment that provides a high quality of life, good place to raise a family and plenty of opportunities for healthy living. It's a rich and historical and cultural landscape, particularly important in terms of developing the area's tourism industry. And it is a good strategic location, being relatively close to the north of England, the Central Belt and Ireland, as has already been described. Tourism and attracting tourists to South Scotland, as mentioned, is one of these strengths and it's vital to the region. And I agree with Oliver Mundell that across South Scotland, we have many micro, small and medium sized enterprises across many sectors, including food and drink sector, such as Galloway Soup and Pro Professor Pod's Chilies, who I visited yesterday. And we've got the tourism and leisure from Lagan Outdoor Centre, Crema Galloway and the Galloway Activity Centre in Loch Ken, where activities for everyone to participate in is part of the, the remit there. So I'd like to see the new South Scotland Enterprise Agency actively working to support the small and medium-sized enterprises and other businesses by helping to attract people to visit them and ultimately by improving the transport links for them. And I would talk for hours, presiding officer, about how this bill is so important, but unfortunately I don't have enough time. But I'd like to congratulate all involved both with the work to get this stage one bill to Parliament, as well as all those who have been involved with the interim South Scotland Economic Partnership. I hear what Mr Carson and others are saying about how people are feeling forgotten. That is what I hear too across the whole region. And many people's perception is that they feel forgotten. So I'd ask Mr Carson to help change that perception. The light is shining on the south of Scotland right now. Let's be positive and objective about promoting our beautiful region and work together for the benefit of the whole of our region. Thank you. I'm sure, sure Mr Carson hears you. Um, I now call on Colin Swift to close for Labour, please. Six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. 
after years of work, today's debate brings us one step closer to establishing the South of Scotland Enterprise Agency the region badly needs. An agency that I hope will be locally led, embedded in the communities it covers, and responsive to the unique needs and assets of the South of Scotland. I welcome the tone of most of today's debate and the widespread consensus from members across the Chamber on the need for and the role of the new agency. This reflects very much the views of the people of the South of Scotland. In response to the consultation by the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee on the bill, 87% of respondents agreed with the plans for a new agency. It's not surprising that there's such a strong appetite locally for change and a new approach. The new agency is not just an opportunity to improve the economic support available in the region, but to encourage collaboration and develop a stronger voice to advocate for the South of Scotland at a national level. We need that new approach to respond to the economic challenges and to meet the potential of the South of Scotland. As we've heard in this debate, productivity in the area is almost a quarter lower than the national average, and the business startup rate is also below that average. And while the region does have a flourishing small business industry with more than 11,300 enterprises, enough is not being done to support and grow those businesses. It's that type of support that needs to be tailored to meet our local needs that is simply not available at present. Wages in the region are also some of the lowest in the country and there's a lack of well-paid high-skilled jobs being one of the key reasons for the continued outward migration of young people. We desperately need to retain uh, or maybe more importantly attract more young people to the area and the key to this is ensuring they have real career options locally. This means creating more high quality jobs but also ensuring that the training and education they need is available locally. The region has also suffered due to the long-standing underinvestment in our infrastructure as several members have highlighted during the debate and I believe the new agency should have a key role to play in advocating for and supporting better transport and digital connectivity in the region. But equally, the region has a huge amount of potential. There are thousands of businesses and enterprises in the area and a great deal of potential for growth if the support they receive is genuinely tailored to meet their needs. A new agency can also take a holistic approach that provides not only economic benefits, but social and environmental benefits. Highlands and Islands Enterprise has been effective in this approach, protecting both communities and their natural environment in their work and showing that this does not need to be in conflict with support in the economy. The bill is therefore a welcome step towards delivering this for the south of Scotland and it sets out a strong framework for the new agency. But as Labour has argued in this debate and as the stage one report from the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee mm -hmm. sets out, we want to see improvements made to the bill to ensure we have an agency that really is rooted in the south of Scotland. That means building on the proposed aims of the agency to also include tackling the demographic challenges facing the region, taking a leadership role in improving transport and digital connectivity, supporting community land ownership and furthering the fair work agenda. It also means amending the bill to ensure there is proper local accountability. The agency needs to be led from the south of Scotland uh, and yet, as the bill currently stands, the board will answer far more to ministers in Edinburgh than it does to local stakeholders. And in response to the... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mike Rumbles. Brian, how he thinks local accountability should operate in this bill. Colin Smith. I thank, I thank Mike Rumbles for, for that point. I'll actually come to that point in my closing comments. I think, crucially, though, it does need to be underpinned by a legal requirement for consultation and reporting back. But I'll, I'll set out in a, in a second exactly how I think this could work. But the first point I want to make is that in response to the committee stage one report, the Cabinet Secretary committed to bringing forward an amendment to ensure ministers cannot issue direction to the agency without consulting first, which I welcome. But the Cabinet Secretary did not respond to calls from the committee and myself for a, a formal mechanism to guarantee local input and accountability in the agency's action plan and strategy underpinned by making this a legal requirement. And I think the government does need to be clearer about how we guarantee local communities' voices will be listened to and reflected. In response to, to Mike Rumble's specific point, I think this could be through, for example, a new regional economic partnership. It could also be through a regular South of Scotland convention, underpinned, I think, by a programme of regular consultation by the agency and communities across the South of Scotland. The type of engagement we've seen already from the South of Scotland Economic Partnership. And there's also an opportunity, I think, to take advantage, for example, of the local authorities' area committee structure to report at a local level some of the performance figures. That's what happens at the moment for Police Scotland. It also happens with the fire service. And there's opportunities uh, to, to take that forward, I think, for the new agency. But whatever that mechanism is, uh, I think it's absolutely crucial that we have to make that a legally binding requirement for 
the new agency. Well, we've also got to, to ensure that the membership of the board is genuinely representative of the south of Scotland, reflecting key stakeholders from young people at, to proper workforce representation. And it also must be gender balanced, as Rhoda Grant rightly highlighted. A number of other important points have also been made by members in the debate, and I want to briefly touch on them. That there was a clear support for the boundary of the new agency to be Dumfriesland, and Galloway and the Scottish borders. I think there was, a, however, a clear point made by Claudia Beamish that those areas on the periphery of Dumfriesland, and Galloway and the borders, such as Clydesdale and South Ayrshire, also have a a, a role to play and a need, I think, for the Scottish Government and Scottish Enterprise to look at the level of support those areas uh, currently receive to make sure that the economic development opportunities are made to meet the needs of those areas. Vocation of the new agency was also touched on and there was a, a clear view that it should be co-located with other agencies such as the Council and have a presence in communities right across the two local authorities, providing, if you like, that one-stop shop to businesses and enterprises seeking support. Presiding officer, in many ways the debate on this, this, this bill has focused on the mechanisms of the new agency, but ultimately the real test will be what that new agency does from day one. There will be a lot of expectations, there's no question about it. And when it doesn't deliver what we want it to deliver, I'm sorry. I'll be the first to highlight that. But uh, what yes, is important... And that's is your job. Thank you. You're finished. I'm sorry. Um, I now call... I now call... Didn't mean, to be, didn't mean to be rude there, Mr Smith. I just mean you're holding government to account, quite rightly. Uh, I now call on Rachel Hamilton, please, to close for seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I register my interest uh, as a business owner in the Scottish Borders? In closing, for the Scottish Conservatives, I want to thank the Rural Economy Committee for their work in gathering evidence from across the south of Scotland. And from the contribu contributions made today, it's clear that this bill will be an enabler when it comes to economic growth and business expansion in the south. And we look forward to the establishment of the enterprise. Some members have described the south of Scotland as a forgotten region. And we've heard today that the south of Scotland desperately needs an injection of skilled workers, infrastructure investment and additional business support. I recently heard from uh, business leaders at a Borders business breakfast that I held, and they are desperate for an agency to help deliver economic growth for the borders. Um, this is to be encouraged because we've heard again today that many businesses must get involved in the, in the process of engagement and that must be in parity with the public sector and educational uh, establishments and the third sector. Um, many have paid uh, tribute to the good work of Russell Griggs, including uh, Joe McAlpine. In the REC report, Professor Ru Russell Griggs says, we want to stop talking about business and talk instead about growing enterprises. It does not matter whether the enterprise is a community, a social enterprise, a small business or a large one. We want to see a culture of change through a new enterprise agency with an understanding that we give support to everyone who wants to help grow the economy. The Scottish Conservatives believe the new agency could be a fantastic catalyst for entrepreneurialism and driving the local economy. John Finney mentioned Barbara Elborn from Newcastle Community Council and uh, Barbara and Greg Cuthbert are energetic individuals who recently set up a community fuel station. And um, on the point of um, setting up and involving local communities, a, a lot of people, Colin Smith, Finlay Carson and uh, Mike Rumbles, feel that the new agency board must have members drawn from a wide pool of experience and must ultimately be transparent and open and accountable to local communities. Stuart Stevenson agrees with this, uh, that there should be strong lines of accountability to the community along with strong skills and perhaps we could get clarity as asked by Colin Smith and reassurance from the Cabinet Secretary in his closing. Many um, uh, Conservatives today have welcomed the uh, Borderlands Growth Deal. Of course, that was one of our manifesto commitments. And um, we want to see what the committee uh, recommended, which is that the agency has the flexibility to operate out with the geographical boundaries of Dumfries and Galloway and the Scottish borders. And this will allow for greater collaboration with other enterprise agencies in order to make it a huge success. Um, given their proximity. Scottish Enterprise today seems to have been uh, a bit like Marmite. Some believe it has done a go good job, but some believe it hasn't. Um, many businesses uh, I have speak to find access to funding complicated, and this must be addressed going forward. We should not see these barriers to funding, and we would like to see an agency which may means obtaining funding and support uh, is made a lot simpler. And whilst we recognise that the South of Scotland Enterprise Agency will not solve all our problems, it may go some way to, to heal them. 
Uh, many members today have mentioned low wage paying jobs, a gender pay gap and a skills uh, shortage right across the region. Um, these three issues are not unique to the borders, however they are definitely exacerbated in a rural area that suffers from uh, poor connectivity, not only uh, digital connectivity which Michelle Ballantyne mentioned but also physical connectivity which Alex Neal and Brian Whittle mentioned. Um, they drew attention to the importance of infrastructure and investment into transport infrastructure, in particular the A77, the A75, the A1, the A68 uh, and the A7, I think I might have missed off. Um, but it's very important east to west and I do believe that the um, campaign for Borders Rail, which is, is trying to um, extend the line uh, from Tweed Bank down to Carlisle, is effectively an east to west uh, connection uh, which would see the borders uh, linked into the north of England and then of course on into uh, uh, the, the west even further. Uh, so yeah, I, I do believe that though however the agency will be an enabler not a disabler and it has to be dynamic to suit the needs of the south of Scotland. Um, whilst we've heard many saying it might be based on the model of the Highlands and Islands Enterprise, it is important that we uh, recognise that the areas are uh, distinctive and different to the Highlands and we share common challenges of course, uh, such as a lack of adequate uh, infrastructure uh, as I've just um, spoken about. Um, Michelle Ballantyne and Oliver Mundell uh, talked about attracting young people and the skills gap and our demographics are very challenging and are becoming more so. Um, the dependency ratio today, which I want to highlight, is 69% versus 55% in Scotland, and that is um, for under 16s and over uh, 65s, retrospectively. Um, sorry, res respectively. And we welcome uh, Maureen Watts' comments about attracting uh, retirees to the area. Um, however, when set against the rising number of older people, uh, to maintain the working age population of today, we need at least 800 working age people per annum to move to the south of Scotland. And this presents a, a real and growing problem, and one much, which must be absolutely addressed with the agency. And we must consider the skills development and the business growth alongside that, especially in tech again, as Alec Neil highlighted. Finlay Carson talked about the poor business startup rate in Dumfries and Galloway, and Brian Whittle told us um, that the medium weekly earnings are 10% lower than the Scottish average, and the GVA per head is 24% below the Scottish average, creating, again, a unique set of issues. Um, we need not only for the agency to create jobs through grants and businesses, but also to create high-quality jobs, and these will attract young people. And, that, and crucially, what we want to do is actually retain these young people and we want to grow a really vibrant and dynamic local economy. Um, many people mentioned uh, tourism and the Scottish Land and Estates emphasised the point in, in the um, giving evidence to the committee at stage one where they called for tourism to be a principal purpose written into the enterprise's action plan. Again, my colleague Finlay Carson called for that. Um, Joe McAlpine talked about the new Sea Scotland, uh, Sea South Scotland campaign, which is so important um, for a, uh, to, to attract new tourism businesses and to grow current ones as well. But I really want to mention the uh, gender pay gap, and um, I was out of the room but caught that Rhoda Grant was talking about um, the, the need to encourage more women to live, work and start family in the area, and we must address that because Agenda actually gave evidence um, highlighting this. Um, with the I'm afraid you've run Scottish out of time. EQI, uh, you've run out of okay, time. Okay, I, I will sit down. You, but we look you forward know to the you agency. will sit down. Thank now. you, President now. Officer. Yes. So much for the gender pay gap. You must sit down. You made your point. Uh, I call on Fergus Hughes, please, to close for the Governor Cabinet Secretary till decision time. I will endeavour to be in my very best behaviour, President Officer. Um, uh, thank you to all members for their contributions in this debate. It's been a largely positive debate and I very much welcome the cross-party support for the new agency uh, and I'm really indebted to the committee but also all the hard work that's led up to the preparation of this bill and the evidence sessions uh, uh, which form part of the stage one process. Whenever I visited the south of Scotland signing officer over uh, some years as a minister I've been struck by the enormous energy, success and vibrancy of people who are taking part in the life and business of the south of Scotland. I've, I've never failed to be impressed by the sheer hard work, the energy, the good humour, 
the resilience of people that I've met and had the privilege to meet in the various responsibilities I've had as a minister. And that is in a whole range of areas, with forestry, farming, transport, manufacturing, textiles, and tourism. But I do think that that potential has not fully been realized, and that is why we are here today. I do accept that many members across the parties have said that there is a perception that the south of Scotland has not received the attention that it deserves. I, I bow to those who represent the area in that regard. It's not for me to contradict that. It's not. And I've heard that that feedback has come from the consultation process. It's right that I have regard to that process, as Mr Finney and others uh, alluded to. Um, I do think that the level of wages and the gender gap problems are two of the most serious issues raised by, by Rachel Hamilton, by Claudia Beamish and by many others. And of course, we want to see that businesses can be as profitable as possible in tourism, where I know Rachel Hamilton has spent her life's work, I believe. Uh, the, many businesses are hampered by a shoulder season. If, as we are doing in parts of the Highlands, presiding officer, we can extend the season to 12 months, then you increase the revenue, you increase the profitability, and you increase the capacity of businesses to pay the kind of wages that they would like to pay their workforce. And therefore, we should look at things in the round. And many businesses in the south of Scotland don't require or even want help from the government. They do perfectly well in running their businesses very successfully indeed because they're doing things, providing services and goods that people want. So not all businesses need uh, or want assistance from the public sector, but those who do should be able to access it. Uh, and that's why when I was in, in Annan recently meeting Keshav Bagat, the owner of the food processing company Bagat Holdings Limited, I was uh, delighted to acknowledge and praise uh, the efforts of public servants in providing a bespoke uh, uh, overall package from Scottish Enterprise, SDI, the local council and Scottish government, which had the result in persuading Mr Bagat and his family who had the pleasure of meeting to, to invest in Scotland, not in other locations, presiding officer, which they had considered, but in Scotland, in Annan, £9 million investment plan. And that was thanks to the hard work of Scottish Enterprise and the investment of a uh, uh, proposed £1.7 million in an RSA grant, which, to, which will be, bring around 120 jobs into Annan with the potential for more. So, these inward investments are very important to Scotland and to the diverse communities in the area. We've engaged widely across the south with businesses, communities, individuals. We want to ensure that everyone's voices are heard uh, and meaningful engagement with those living, working and studying in the south remains a key component of our work. And we will continue that engagement, Claudia Beamish, with young people and community representatives, something that I think you laid emphasis on quite fairly. Uh, the body will, of course, as is stated in the uh, description of the aims of the bill at the current state, have regard to improving the, the amenity and environment of the south of Scotland. That's already in the aim under paragraph 5.1. Regarding accountability, sections 13 and 14 require the preparation of accounts of an annual report, and section 6 requires an action plan. These are ways in which public bodies are held to account. They are also held to account through this parliament. Uh, all public bodies can be summoned to give evidence in this parliament by committees, and Mr Mountain is nodding because he has done precisely that. Uh, so this parliament is the fulcrum of accountability in Scotland, and it will remain so. But members are right that we wish further to explore how we can improve lines of accountability even further. Alex Neal made the point that has uh, been one that, that uh, has kind of flitted through my cranium from time to time, that, that one of the issues of the south of Scotland and Fries and Galloway is that there is, there's, connect, there's connections with uh, uh, the borders to Edinburgh, particularly of Dumfries to the west and to Northern Ireland, but the east-west Dumfries and Galloway borders connections perhaps are not good. And that led, I think, to uh, his, uh, his claim for rather a lot of expensive public money, but admittedly over a period of two decades, which was a bit of a relief to Mr Mackay. Uh, and this was followed by many other members. Now, uh, we will consider this, no doubt, at stage two, presiding officer, 
but I fully expect the new South of Scotland Economic uh, Agency to give leadership on these matters, taking up Mr Smith's point, and I thought he put it, uh, as far as I could gather, quite well uh, when he suggested not that this body would have fiscal responsibility for budget responsibility for these issues, but they would have a say, they would take an interest, they would have an influence, they would have a leadership role. It would be part of their work to consider connectivity, whether it be virtual through the internet, which is of course of increasingly importance, or of transport, both road and, as Mr Finney uh, was at pains to remind us uh, more than once, rail. And he's quite right to do so, and the success of the Borders Railway uh, has been uh, one of, uh, one of the, the uh, stellar achievements over the past, uh, past while. Uh, so I was heartened to be taking part in a debate, presiding officer, uh, where I wouldn't say it was characterised by sweetness and light, but there was rather less discord than in some of the debates of taking part, uh, not looking at anyone in particular, but, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, but without wishing to spoil the, the, uh, the sweetness and light, uh, presiding officer, there is a serious job to be done in the remainder of the bill. And whereas I haven't had an opportunity to reply to all the points that are made, um, uh, particularly to Mr. Rumbles, Mr. Finney, Mr. Smith, um, Mr. Whittle, uh, as I'd wished, uh, we will no doubt come back to these issues uh, before the completion of the passage of this bill. Um, I'd like to pay tribute to uh, Professor Russell Griggs and all of those who have played a part uh, in the, the uh, partnership which he has chaired. I think they've done a sterling job and I personally cannot recall any example where there has been more public engagement uh, leading up to the, uh, the, pr the preparation of a bill before Parliament. Uh, and I do think that the members on the partnership bring a wide range of business experience, of third sector experience, of leadership in further and higher education and throughout the whole uh, sector. Um, the last thing I would say uh, is that uh, the budget has, of course, exercised the minds of members, quite rightly so, and we've had a, a wide range of views. Mr. Mason indicated that there are arguments that, um, that, that uh, we haven't heard so much of with regard to budgetary priorities, but the overwhelming view was the approach that we are taking is the correct one, that recognises that there should be, in principle, parity of esteem between all citizens in rural Scotland and that should have an influence and it has had in determining the approach we are taking to our policy. But I think I did discern that there is a consensus in the approach that we are taking that we do need to walk before we can run and it will therefore take time for the new agency to find its feet to be established throughout the huge area of Dumfries and Galloway and the Scottish borders. Uh, to deliver and meet the expectations of the people of the south of Scotland. Uh, I'm therefore delighted to preside over such a cheerful debate, presiding officer. Perhaps, uh, perhaps it's something to do with me. I don't know. <laughs> but I commend the bill to the House. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate this afternoon. The next item, though, is consideration of motion 15863 on the financial resolution for the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill. And could I call on Derek Mackay to move this motion? Moved. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item is consideration of business motion 16577 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a change to tomorrow's business. Uh, could I call on Graham Day to move this motion? Moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And no one wishes to speak against the motion. The question, therefore, is that motion number 16577 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And we turn to decision time. Uh, there are just two questions. The first question is that motion 16542 in the name of Fergus Ewing on the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the next question is that motion 15863 in the name of Derek Mackay on the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill financial resolution be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We're going to move shortly to members' business in the name of Maurice Corrie on financial scam prevention. But we'll just take a few moments for uh, members and the minister to ministers to change seats. <laughs>